start with that and then I'll read this. Okay, all rise for the pledge. Sven? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Take seats. Welcome to the Town of New Canaan Town Council Public Hearing. This is Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, and it is 7.01. This will be a virtual hybrid meeting. Those wishing to participate in the meeting may attend in person or connect to Zoom. I think we even have some town council members on Zoom tonight. The Zoom meeting ID is 842-1004-6647. And the passcode is 532384 if you're watching on 79 and you'd rather participate by Zoom. And our agenda is only to solicit public comment on proposed use of American Rescue Plan Act funds. And with that, uh, let's take the roll. Okay. Robin Bates Mason. Here. Tom Butterworth. Uh, Liz Donovan. Uh, John Engel? Here. Uh, Sven Englund? Here. Mark Jimsky? Here. Steve Carl? Here. Mike Morrow? Maria Naughton? Christina Ross? Rich Townsend? Here. Penny Young? Here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. You have a quorum. Okay. So the meeting is open. And... Um... So before we begin, let's just say a few words. Um, people said, so what's going on tonight? And we said, we need to have a public hearing where we can not only hear proposals. So we're inviting people to speak if they have proposals or if they don't have proposals and they would like to reflect on uh, what they've heard in the meetings to date. I think we had uh, a public hearing I don't know if it was a public hearing. It was a joint meeting where the New Canaan Community Foundation participated, but I don't think it constituted a public hearing. So this is our first opportunity to have a public hearing and reflect on the events of, of that first meeting um, and the subsequent conversations we've had in our town council meetings where the first selectman has reported to us uh, what's, been, what's made his short list. Um, so... I think we'll hear some proposals tonight. We'll hear some reflections tonight um, on what you've heard from the selectmen and from our own subcommittee meeting uh, led by Mark Jimsky. <clears throat> and then we should have a conversation. Um, Rich suggested that the town council members should be allowed to ask questions of the presenters. And I think that's a good idea. So um, we will not stand on ceremony if you want to leap up, Sven, and ask a question. You know, that's allowed. Okay, thanks, John. All right, so with that, let's turn it over to Chris Shipper for the first uh, presentation or reflection on how we should use the ARPA money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the town council. My name is Chris Shipper. I live at 8 Ferris Hill Road. I have a short two-minute uh, uh, reflection, I should say. Signed into law on March 11th, 2021, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 provides a unique opportunity for local government to make strategic investments in long-lived assets. Those funds should be spent or allocated by the end of calendar year 2024, basically a three-year cycle plus some tail unless they amend it. Our Town Conservation Commission recently made a motion requesting the Town Council guide or steer one-third of ARPA funds to public space and sustainability programs. Our belief is this allocation meets equity, health, and climate resilience hurdles that are laid out in the ARPA plan. No town asset has had greater use during this COVID pandemic than our public places. Investing for the long-term in public spaces supports public health long-term. Improved public space accessibility and there you must think seniors and strollers 
through an interconnected network or green link of sidewalks and trails will generate long-term public health benefits from outside exercise and less fossil fuel combustion. Think about executing a town-wide plan improving walkability and bikeability. Our parks need a lot of trail development and improvement for better accessibility. Public facilities like bathrooms and wireless hotspots, park maintenance of trees and gardens for pollinators and year-round beauty, educational signage and more. Our parks add immeasurably to the quality of life for our residents. Another idea is a three-year program to increase tree coverage around town. From South and Main and up Owen Oak Smith and West Roads, we should be thinking about what the long-term look of our town will be and the loss of so many major trees in recent years in that growth cycle. This very useful long-term plan would support resilience as well as clean air and water. Just the recent new plantings that have been undertaken in Bristow and Waveney should just be the start of a town-wide effort. Secondly, migrating town land care equipment from two-stroke engines to quieter battery systems for blowers, whackers, and mowers will be a leadership by example opportunity for the town with lots of health benefits from lower emissions and noise. On the sustainability front, swap shop funding makes total sense for both sustainability and equity reasons. Food scrap recycling, which represents nearly one third of our waste stream needs to be expanded. More reverse vending machines should be installed to increase glass, plastic and aluminum recycling. We should be adding EV charging stations and find a way to drive more solar installation in our town. Investing in sustainability, be it recycling, solar, cogeneration, tree planting, pollinator pathways, lawn, lawns to meadows, water testing and conservation, electric charging stations, transfer stations, swap shop, and more will be an effort that could be supercharged with some focused ARP funding. The, conversation, the Conservation Commission can be asked to evaluate opportunities to enhance public space as well as sustainability efforts in New Canaan. Public space addresses equity, sustainability addresses environmental impact. Open space has been the town's most heavily used asset over the COVID cycle and a key factor in bringing new families to New Canaan from urban settings and providing healthful enjoyment for our long-term residents. Sustainability projects address long-term environmental impact of greater work at home presence and growing local tourism. Please, as a body, stay top-down focused and be sure to allocate one third of ARPA funds to public spaces and sustainability. Thank you for your consideration. <coughs> Any questions of Chris? I just, Chris, if you just want to mention about the, the green link, because I don't under, think people understand the cost of the crosswalks, whether they haven't been put in. Our town has a series of uh, public parks that are partially connected by walking trails and hiking trails. I think an effort over the next few years to improve that linkage so that people can wander from Waveney up to Irwin and in a relatively safe manner, as opposed to hiking along 106 or what have you, would be a great factor. And I think all of us recognize as we drive through town during the day, there are more and more people walking and we have to be cognizant of making them safe when they walk. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a concept of many cities that they have a, um, an emerald necklace of parks and that they're connected and that they can be visited in, in, in rotation and from neighborhoods. So. Uh, I feel that um, working in that kind of green link concept, which connects our town and gives visitors to our town a chance to visit several parks or walk and uh, have friends come in and go for a walk is, is a great opportunity just for our citizens and for our guests. And it's getting close. It's getting close. From, from Irwin, you know, we make the crossing and uh, take the back trail up in the green link trail up through the nature center. Mm -hmm. And then we would need a uh, crossing at Owen Oak to hit the sidewalk there and come back down into town. It's a nice loop. And, and tour the newly historic renovations or the, the, the trail renovations they put in the historical museum just recently. So, um, you know, connectability and walkability and, and walkability where you can be a senior or with a stroller 
is something we should look mm-hmm. to. And I, I don't want to rule out biking, but I really want to get people out walking as well. So when I look at the current list of proposals, we'll start with the first selectman's list from the other night. I see a uh, half a million dollar uh, for e- open space fund. I see tree work that you just uh, mentioned, tree removal and improvement. I see earmarked not on his list for 50,000. And I do see investment alongside w- matching funds for Waveney Park Conservancy projects of 250,000. Um, I don't, and I see the flexi pave project at Mead Pond in for 125. So if I add these up, 375, so eight, 875,000 is already on here, um, albeit half for open space acquisition and half investing in, yep. in our parks. Is that adequate or is that just a good start? I think it's a good start, but I think there are more ideas, particularly along the sustainability side, that can be developed and and promoted to make this a more sustainable town, to you know, to be more in sync. And I think I think a lot of the newcomers here want to want to see that. And and a lot of the people who lived here a long time want to see conservation and and uh, good town management. So I'm I am um, I'm cognizant of what's there. I'm also cognizant from a strategic standpoint that as a town council, you have to have both a top-down guidance on what you're looking for, as well as a bottom-up growth of ideas. And, um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that the, the town council, having the longest purview of the town and the broadest reach in its, in its purview, uh, can continue to try to guide or steer in uh, the, the simple observation I came up is when you looked at what WPA funds did during the depression, a massive amount of money went into park development, park improvement. Mead Park itself was basically developed and dredged through that process. Uh, Bristow's trails were reinforced, things like that. It's a good time to do these things. So, and, and it, it takes a watchful eye because you will bubble up many multiples of the ARP funding, but somebody has to sit there on the, uh, you know, on the pressure cooker a little bit and let the steam out, but keep the balance going. Chris, you, <clears throat> you, you've laid out a whole bunch of really great ideas. Uh, is, is, there, is there a longer term plan or can we take this opportunity to put a longer term plan in place as you suggest? I think so. And I think that, um, you know, we have three years. There are some plans already in place, be it at Waveney Park or Irwin Park that different organizations have made, but we're not really a totally integrated right. planning process. Mead Park could use a, a better master plan. Kiwanis has recently undergone some things, but I think it takes a top-down view to say, how do we make our linkages work? How do we make our town more sustainable? <clears throat> the, long, the, the long-term plan of conservation and development suggests we should be more walkable and we should be more bicyclable, right. and that's been around for a long time it has with been. little progress. It ha- there's, there's been progress, but it, it has been there, but in, in verbiage, not in plan, not in implementation programs. And I think we're moving to a point where we can get closer to implementation programs in a, in a somewhat more consistent manner. So uh, I, I, think think that, I think that would really be valuable if we took this opportunity to do that. Is there a reason you came up with a third and not a half? Uh, um, or <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I would say... I would say because I'm cognizant of, of our treasury goals, I'm cognizant of uh, the healthcare effects. And to be honest with you, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, whereas you guys are overview and finance is sort of functional, I'm sort of operational down the conservation axis. Mm-hmm. So I'm cognizant that there are other axes here from a, in, in an operational sense. So I'm just trying to focus on this one to, um, to, to come up with a third. I just felt like, if you looked at our our spending in general as a town of our 150 million, it's nowhere near a third towards sure. these kind of areas. And this is such a unique opportunity that yes, it may seem overweight by our average spending, but we've tended to underspend, I think, in our public parks and spaces in time. It's been one of those areas where it's been a nice to have. And I'm beginning, and I've having been as a conservation commissioner in other roles. I think it's a must have for a great town. Have you given any thought to the priorities of what you ran through and how, how far you get on those with, the, with this uh, you know, kind of kickstart 
I have given some thought to that. And, and one, of, one of my realizations is that if we really want to move this green link plan forward, we really have to just pull the big map up and say, so what are the remaining links mm -hmm. that we need to do? Um, we need to figure out how to work with state roads that tend to be a constant. We want to do something, but it'll take eight years before you can get uh, Across the water. highway department to say, oh, okay, we can, we can do that. But there are a lot of other programs, EV stations, um, things that, you know, will help our, our, our movement through our town. And, and it's such a pretty town that the fact that we're not walking it and, and visiting it and bringing tourists in to see it is a missed opportunity. Just one more question, and that is, during the COVID pandemic here, did we have a degradation to our open spaces that needs to be backfilled in terms of maintenance and or? Uh, there, there were some examples of it. When you have increased visitation, you have increased um, debris, for instance, in parks. So you have to install doggy systems to, to capture that. Um, you have you have you know a, a surfeit of desire for public facilities when you have a thousand people you know we don't really accommodate that you you basically see some stress points but you also um recognize that people are walking through here you know enjoying our town and there are some parts that could be more enjoyable or, or more amenable to visitation and i'm i'm really thinking you know in the end people who are working from home and need a, an hour break to clear their head and take a walk or, mm -hmm. or go see something. Um, and elderly people who are you know, in place but can't congregate in public places need a place to go. And we need to, we need to accommodate that. Thank you. Chris, if I may say something, the New Cane Nature Center, when Ann Harper was the director, created a master plan of all the parks with the green links and the connections. Mm -hmm. You may wanna to go to them if you don't have it already. Right. I have the original little card that mm -hmm. showed how it might work and, and where the missing links were. But I do have some of those ideas. And I think it's and I think, you know, the Green Link will be part of the plan of conservation and development. And, and that process starts just about next year, I think. Right. It's all, it starts in 2022. It gets done in 2023 and it gets published in 2024. So, you know, we're in that cycle. So I want to reflect on what you just said in, in, in uh and tell you what I think. I think that there are some things on this, like open space that come up, uh, acquisition fund that come up every year in our budget and never get budgeted. And other things I see on our five-year plan. I mean, I, I, you know, the, paint, the the vine cottage renovation, you know, is the kind of thing I usually see on the five-year capital plan. The flexi pave paving of of trails. These are things that we put on our five-year plan. So. As I hear these ideas, I think to myself, we have an opportunity with the ARPRA money to do some things that we wouldn't ordinarily do on our five-year capital plan. And so I, will, for, for one, will be looking to see if there are any things that we wouldn't ordinarily do that we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with a $6 million to do. So, um, and I haven't decided what those are yet, but that's one one thing that's entering into my thinking. When I see flexi paved path, I say that's something that could be put in the five year capital plan. But I see that other things never seem to make it because they're not capital. They're not capital projects. So when you talk about ordinances and other things, I think, oh, okay, these are not typically found in our in our plan, and that's you know creative thinking. Thank you, John. And I would like to just speak to that open space fund uh, opportunity. Um, two observations. Just recently, a property right at the corner of the Bead Park exit came available and wasn't, and, and is now a demolition site and wasn't considered as a potential add on to Mead Park, mm -hmm. which is always, if you don't take advantage of adjacencies when they come up, you're, you're, you're missing big opportunities. The other example from three years ago was that little uh, building at the end of Mill Pond, the one in the corner there, that was available for maybe a half a million dollars or something, and yet it got sold off. Now it's a development. It's, you know, it, it could have been a great, beautiful corner to that park. Uh, and it was a missed opportunity because it, the, the town wasn't funded or capable of thinking of acting or stepping in. And um, for the long term, I mean, we've been we've been very fortunate to have Waveney Park and Mead Park and Irwin Park, these great parks. 
But the next big opportunities of open space are going to be water company lands. And if the town isn't a partner in those discussions, there's no chance an all volunteer organization can be a negotiating party. It, you know, the town has to be prepared to evaluate serious open space opportunities. And I think the plan of conservation development, when we get to it, will address that issue. So thank you for that spin on it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Chris, you had four or five items that were items that we've discussed, you know, in terms of sustainability programs for the town. How do you feel that fits with the ARPA philosophy? Uh, you know, I, I, I see that as, as a, an impact of COVID, which is greater at home. And, and the simple measure was Tiger saying our, our, our throughput through this transit station is up, you know, 28%. Mm -hmm. And we're just, we're just, there's more local generation, more at home, more bottles, more whatever. And um, I, I think that that's, that's a repercussion that has to be managed. And, and at the same time, the cost of our recycling, the cost of shipping containers away is, is rising. So if we don't start to manage that, you know, we're not doing our part. So um, I believe it can, I believe it will fit. And it's also, these are programs, they're not huge dollar programs. They're just dollar programs that you can jumpstart or get initiated and make a difference, which is if we can just peel off 1% or 2% okay. or 3%, of what we're throwing out or incinerating and recycle it, we're making good progress. Thank you. Who's next, Tucker? Thanks, Chris. So obviously we spent 25 minutes or whatever with the first one. We won't do that each time, but uh, I think that was important because that was sort of a general uh, overview of a whole lot of projects. Okay, Patricia, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Town Council, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I think you're in a, a challenging situation, but one that's a good situation to be in for the town and being awarded the, the funds, the ARPA funds. So I am Patricia Spagani. I've been in town for 27 years. My husband's with me, Joel Reynolds. Uh, we are both volunteers at the Town Players of New Canaan, which I think, as you know, is the town's community theater. Um, I have provided you the written copy or printed copy of the proposal that I sent to John last week. Uh, we also, this is show and tell day, we brought the model so that you could envision what we're actually uh, have plans now in place for um, with the architects in town, the Rothbarts who have worked with us closely to envision what our proposal would cover. So I would like to give you, um, John invited me to talk for about five minutes or so and then answer any questions, but I'd like to give you kind of an overview of the theater because I'm not sure how many of you have actually had the opportunity to visit our theater or know very much about its history. So I think it's, it's worth understanding that perspective. Um, and um, okay, so let's give a brief overview. The Town Players was founded in 1946 as a nonprofit community theater. It was founded by uh, residents of the town who were professional actors from New York City, as well as um, just actors who liked doing theater in the community. And they said, we need a theater. So 1946, that was 75 years ago. The group of thespians performed primarily within our public schools until 1982 when they approached the town and said, there's an abandoned building in Waveney Park. It's the powerhouse and gee, that would make a great theater. It's like, we have a barn, let's put on a play. So with the town and at the time, the Lions Club in town, they raised the funds to convert the powerhouse uh, with the town council's blessing into what is now the community theater. During that time, we've had a very, very strong partnership with the town. And of course now with Tiger Man and his team um, in basically maintaining the exterior of the building. And that's our current arrangement and the town players during the 40 or 35 years that we've occupied the building, we have maintained the inside of the building, including all the utilities, um, anything that needs to be done inside, that's our purview. And most recently, it's been my husband's domain. 
So uh, in terms of the partnership, it's very strong and equitable, and you know, we, we take that responsibility very seriously. It's worked out really well. And then a few other things about the theater in terms of by the numbers, because I know that's important as you're considering the breadth of what the investment would cover. We see about 2,000 individuals in our theater on an annual basis, okay, COVID aside, about 3,000 people visit the theater every year to see our five main stage productions, as well as what we call our stage two shows, which are usually stage readings. Um, they include a radio show that we do annually. We host new playwrights to come and um, read, have their plays read and listen to and get reactions from audience members. So we do a lot of different things on, the, on that stage. We primarily produce dramas, although we do the occasional musical. Our holiday show is geared towards families to come and enjoy. This year we're doing a Christmas Carol, two different performances. Come, you get to see two different versions of it, one student show and one adult. We're also actively, and I say actively, pursuing increasing or re-energizing, recreating our youth program. For about 30 years, we had a student um, or youth workshop during the summer. That pretty much came to a halt when the director of that program aged out and then the pandemic hit. So we have now um, brought several different programs into the theater. Many of you, some of you will know a Mr. John Hastings from the um, country school who taught their fourth grade and he's running an improv class there during the school year now he's retired from teaching and is doing an improv class with students uh, so you'll see mr hastings improv signs up in the park and that's what that's about we also have um, established uh, the early stages of a partnership with the open arts alliance that is an organization that's been running very successfully in Greenwich by a few very dedicated professional uh, theater folks who are dedicated to both bringing theater to youth and seniors, and they have very um, successful program. And it's just is not just um, putting on a show with children, but also building leadership skills and um, bringing a, a social connection between the students and the seniors in the community. They've done sub programs at Waveney in the past, and we're looking at bringing that program into um, New Canaan. Their production of Cinderella will, uh, will be done in the fall, I mean, in the spring, and they'll do a Christmas Carol in, the, at Christmas, in December. So we have a lot of things going on. We're very, very busy. Our calendar is chock full. Um, it's just, it's a very lively place. And I will tell you that my husband and I, and we've been working, getting ready for the show that's opening up in two weeks. And we have three or four people knocking on our door every day while we're there working, not only for using the restrooms, but saying, gee, there's a theater here. Wow, this is great. I'm from Darien. We don't have that kind of thing. I'm from Stamford. We love this park. We come here all the time. Wow, we didn't know there's a theater here. So we know we bring people in from outside of the community to enjoy what we do. So our 3,000 patrons, about 60% of those individuals are from the town of New Canaan as residents. The other 40% come from surrounding communities and certainly friends and family that travel from out of state. But we know because we talk to everybody that comes in our door, we have a very good welcoming committee and we know that they go to dinner in town. We know that they enjoy the park. We know that they shop before they come. Uh, we know that we are bringing people to town and that's part of our objective here, right? Is to drive economic development. Um, we have referenced in the letter that I gave you a couple of reports that we've seen that show the value, quantified value of a very highly energetic community theater. And we believe that the town players of New Canaan and the powerhouse theater do this for our community. So with that, what is our proposal? Our proposal is that we realize a vision that the founders 
of the theater or the developers, the folks that envisioned the powerhouse theater had when they went came to the town council in the 80s, which was to take and enclose what was or is now a concrete patio outside of the lobby and enclose that so that we can expand the lobby more than double the space. Our theater is 115 seats. There's no way that we comfortably fit maybe 30 people in the lobby at one time. I know there's a few familiar faces here that have come to the theater. So in the days where we all are more conscious of our social distancing space, we really can't support that. So at the time that was um, envisioned to be a greenhouse because there were greenhouses in that part of Waveney Park. I assume you all know where the theater is in Waveney Park right next to the carriage barn. So we envision in, in closing that. And then also as part of that, we will include ADA restrooms, which have all be already been approved and funded by the town. And what we're doing after multiple iterations with a few different architects, we landed on what we think is a really wonderful design that will be a huge draw, additional draw in the community and to Waveney. And we would realize the vision of what was defined originally and called the Powerhouse Performing Arts Center. Well, we don't really have an art center per se today, we have the Powerhouse Theater. So I'm gonna step away from the microphone and Tucker, tell me if that's a problem. No, no, we can hear you. Okay, so what we, I'm gonna do a little visual here. So this part here, this is, would be the new lobby. I'm gonna take this nice copper standing scene roof off and show you that this is currently the cement courtyard. And what we would do is cover that over with the structure, with the roof, with a nice little extension here that we could use for either um, a little bar set up during the show. We could put small events in the lobby itself and have a little stage there. We could do a quartet there at intermission got lots of use. This area behind the courtyard is where our office is and that's where the restrooms would be. And you all have a floor plan there. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, our primary scope is. So then as we sat back and we talked with Tiger and we talked with the rough parts who we hired and also um, the town is using to place public bathrooms on this part of the park which are woefully needed because we know that because our bathrooms are often used today. The original plan was to take the potting shed and turn that into the public restrooms. And I think having Tiger been before the council to make that proposal. And we said, gee, really do you want to take this wonderful building? Wouldn't it be a better use of space to turn that into a black box theater, rehearsal space, center for the youth arts program, and instead put the restrooms, the public restrooms at the end of what currently exists in our prop room and costume room and extend the roof line, extend where the utilities are going to be in place. So that's another conversation for you to have with Tiger, but our proposal that I have in front of you represents the potting shed as a shed theater. I think shed theater sounds a little odd. Shed theater, which we would use again for all of those purposes, which we think would create a nice campus, a wonderful campus, and would give us as the theater room to expand the programs that we have in place. The other thing that we envision um, that we would work with Parks and Rec, and probably end the conservancy. We've met with Stephen Beshenshine as well, and she likes this plan too. Is that we, this courtyard would be re landscaped. So, one and first and foremost, it would be accessible because right now this space has multiple elevations. There's stairs over mm -hmm. on the far side of the parking area. There is a drain right in front of the walkway, the handicapped depression in the, the walkway. It's very uncomfortable. There's trees here. There's no benches for people to sit and wait. So we envision this whole space being reimagined and being accessible and being an extension of the lobby when we have a show going on. When not, maybe there'd be a couple of picnic tables for people to sit, have access to the bathrooms, 
and have a nice area that would truly complement the space and make it finish. So that is the design that we have for the, the two buildings. The funding that we think the project requires all in is 1.3 million, which would cover both the lobby, the bathrooms, the ADA compliant bathrooms, and the putting in a floor, basically putting in a floor in the, the shed, the potting shed. And that would give us the funds to complete the project, plus allow us to set aside some funds for an endowment, because we've heard loud and clear from the town that it, buildings need to be maintained and maintainable. And advice that we were given as we go into fundraising is make sure you, you know, try to get enough funds that so that you can continue to support it. So that's how we've kind of priced this out. We have in hand $250,000 from our own funds, from a grant from the Community Foundation that was awarded last year, from, and that includes the, the town allocation already made for the ADA bathrooms. So we're gonna to continue to fundraise. That's my primary role. Um, I also do lighting at the theater. So if you don't like what you see, that's because that's my, anyway, so that's my other uh, avocation. And that's what we're, we're proposing. So we think that this would be a huge improvement to, for the town, it would create a legacy. We've been there 40 years. We wanna be there another 100 years as a community theater. We're one of the oldest community theaters in Fairfield County. I think Wilton <coughs> might be the oldest of the Wilton play shop, um, but we're, we're going strong. Uh, we kept open during the, pan didn't come open during the pandemic, but we did performances that we streamed. Uh, we all socially distanced in the theater, the, those are three of us that put the productions on. Um, so we were able to continue to raise some funds, which was good. So we didn't lose any money during the pandemic, just about broke even. I will mention that financially, we were not able to apply or get any grants uh, from the COVID relief funds for the arts, because 100% of those grants require that you had at least one employee. And we are a 100% volunteer organization. So we were not eligible for any of the, the federal grants that other theaters like Curtain Call got a lot of money from. So that's our story. Uh, again, I think the theater enhancements we're talking about will allow us to do the programs, which will support the youth and seniors in our community. I should say that we have a very strong senior population, large senior population that comes to our matinees. Uh, so the ADA compliant bathrooms, the new ones up to current code are really important. We have grab bars and whatnot in our existing bathrooms, but they're not up to the current standards. And we just think this would be a great addition to the town and support and benefit anyone who enjoys the arts. Thank you. One or two minutes for the questions. I know we got a lot more speakers. Have any questions? Okay, thank, thank you very much. So thank you. Please come our show. It's going to be very. It's going to be a good show for Halloween. Turning of the screw. Turning of the screw. <laughs> and when? What day is it? it? Opens in two weeks on the fifteenth through the end of the month. Fifteenth. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, you let anybody know if all the people on Facebook they want to get to them. Okay, so people watching this meeting on Zoom, uh, please let Tucker know in the chat that you wish to speak. We will get to you. You will be able to present through Zoom after we get through the people who are in the room. Um, and who is next on our list? It's Bill Flynn. Bill Flynn. New Canaan Nature Center. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good, Good to see you. Hey, Bill. How's it going? Good. We're good. Um, again, my name is Bill Flynn. I'm the executive director of the New Canaan Nature Center. And a lot of these uh, ARPA fund conversations um, we have been aware of, um, but especially coming from a conversation that happened uh, this morning at um, an, a director's group that meets through the New Canaan Community Foundation hosts it. 
and a large sentiment of that group, which I'm not going to speak for a lot of people who are here who are going to speak soon, but um, is what exactly the parameters are for accessing these funds and what really is the goal of the town. Uh, in our world of uh, we're big into grant writing. And so this sort of feels like we're, we're applying for a grant or making that pitch and knowing specifically what the most important thing from the town would be, would help, uh, help us a lot. And so we've, we've gotten a lot of, um, uh, if you look at the list of projects that are on here, um, it is, um, not 100% clear, at least, at least from, from my, uh, my view of what is the most beneficial ask for say the New Canaan Nature Center. So I'll give a couple of examples that'll sort of illustrate this point to a lot of what Chris was talking about earlier uh, about uh, supporting our green spaces. So uh, again, a reminder for the New Canaan, for everyone listening, the New Canaan Nature Center is a town owned uh, property, uh, owns the town and the buildings. The New Canaan Nature Center Association is the designated agent that fulfills uh, how it was deeded. So if it were, was the goal of the town to promote green spaces, we have a lot of projects such as a pond dredging that's coming up. And uh, I talked to, uh, I know Tiger's uh, here on the call, so please jump in and correct me if I get any of this information wrong, but uh, there are a lot of projects that come up for the New Canaan Nature Center that will make it on that five-year uh, budget plan, but given uh, you know emergencies or things that happen, a lot of those projects do get kicked down the timeline. So John, to your point earlier of what maybe would be projects that would be harder to fund in a normal budget cycle, but given these funds, we could knock it out and preserve our Kiwanis Pond, which was, is our first of two man-made ponds on property. If this was the impetus and the money that was there and we could get it done uh, and not get kicked down and happen in eight years and actually preserve the pond and, and keep it, that would be very interesting to us and we would uh, you know, very much support that. Another uh, side, especially with uh, with childcare, um, we have uh, our Audubon house. So I'll use an example. It's a, it's a building that's uh, very run down, not usable right now, but uh, we have a plan in place that if we are able to renovate that, we can fit uh, two more twos classes. Uh, so we have a 60 family wait list right now for twos. Um, with that building, we could you know, fit 16 more families in our program of that 60 family wait list. And that would help out, you know, a lot of people looking for that uh, early childhood uh, program. How many so, people do you have in the program now? And how many on the wait list? We have 114 uh, kids, but just in our twos program, we have a 60 family wait list. Uh, that is absolutely from an influx of uh, families over the last, last few years. Um, but sort of to those two examples, um, you know, what's more intriguing to town? Is it fixing up one of our buildings that is town owned that we can use it and serve the purpose for the community? And also it generates revenue for the New Canaan Nature Center Association, which as we are able to secure our finances more, the more we put back into the property like the Nature Center. Is that more intriguing or is it partnering with the Conservation Commission and land trusts and working on more of an overall green plan. And so uh, for me, I, I, have, I have lots of proposals that, you know, I don't have any uh, numbers in front of me today. Like the pond dredging is still being uh, uh, bidded out right now. So they don't have a final number. I guess more of what I'm asking is, uh, what is our most beneficial information for you that you could, uh, so we could make the, the most intelligent ask? Um, and so that, that's really, I, I think, from our conversation this morning, uh, it was a lot of the nonprofit leaders, again, not speaking for all of you, but um, it was that sentiment of what, what is the town really looking for and, and how, can, how can we help? Because that's what the nonprofit community does is we uh, provide those services in town. So that is I'll what, try and answer that question. Sure. Based on what I've read, both have found their way onto the paper a million dollar earmark for the New Canaan Community Foundation, you know, is just that. It, I mean, it's putting off that decision to a different day on how to allocate the million dollars. Whereas some projects like Flexi Pave Path around Mead Park, is very specific. And somebody said, I don't wanna just be lumped in with a million dollars worth of projects. 
I want to, I want the opportunity to present a specific project like pond dredging. So we're giving people an opportunity to do both. It doesn't necessarily, and, and so I'm glad you mentioned pond dredging and I'm glad you mentioned the Audubon house. And so those will, you know, percolate in our heads and we'll, and we will probably discuss among ourselves and with the board of finance, uh, if we want to basically pick, pick winners, pick some specific projects instead of just earmarks, but it could go either way. Right. Another, another example uh, that I just thought of while we're doing it is there's a, the rock house is this small little uh, red building. It's, it's uh, very it's falling down. Charming building that is falling down. The roof needs to be repaired. So Bill Osman has a quote of $18,000 to fix that roof. It hosts a very extensive rock collection, but when you're going to... How many two-year-olds can you put in a rock house? Zero two-year-olds, <laughs> except when they're visiting. But to a project like that, it's not, it's not particularly um, uh, serving directly our need of the nature center, but that building will collapse and fall down if, if the roof is not repaired, is a town-owned building. So for Tiger to come and say, I mean, don't want to speak for you, Tiger, I know you're listening, but to say I need $18,000 for this building, it's sort of, well, why would you need to do that? And for us, it's very, <clears throat> it's very important to us to preserve that building and preserve the a rock collection that originally um, uh, honored the Susan Dwight Bliss, who had a, mm -hmm. a love of geology. And, and so it, it's, it's a very intriguing pro project for us, but it's got an expensive price tag. And for uh, funds like this, we could do something that maybe we wouldn't be able to do, but since funds are available, we could, we could do. So there's, there's a lot of things around the Nature Center uh, like that. And again, these are town-owned buildings, so it'd be preserving some town-owned buildings. I know, Penny, you know all about all of our uh, buildings there at the Nature Center being part of the building. Um, uh, committee a few years ago. So uh, there's a lot, lot going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to know just really how best to, to uh, access funds if, if, if they are available. And I know a lot of the other nonprofits are, are asking the similar question. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I I'd go for child question. care. Yeah. This is not, well, kind of and not specific at the same time. Sure. Um, do you have any feel for where we are statewide or nationally on mandated pre-k um no but uh it is something uh, I, I mean i read uh I, I i don't know if i read as much as you do about it but mandated pre-k could be coming um but that would i would uh, uh, i gather would be done through the uh, public schools unless they were offered an option where they could uh, partner with private organizations and fulfill whatever standards they have. So to that point, if they were needing uh, an already an educational facility to uh, implement that, then we'd need the space for it. Okay, I Certainly. just didn't know if you had been following it um, from your own future strategic plan, long range planning, you know. Okay, thank you. Bill, how many children did you say you have in the two year old program presently? Uh, Presently, we have uh, 24, um, and this would up it to a capacity of 40 for that specific example. 42-year-olds. So total, total number of students presently is 24? Uh, just in the twos, so okay. 114 in our, in our preschool. Okay. When it says on this list, YMCA, expand infant daycare, do you provide any infant daycare? No, and I'm sure... Um, I'm sure you'll hear more about infant daycare uh, soon, but that is not something we're currently uh, doing. Is it something you've ever thought about doing? Uh, we've been approached and asked, um, and daycare, uh, just given what our uh, nature-based early childhood program is, um, we want to currently focus on that and make it the best we can without expanding into that. Mm -hmm. Do you have a morning and an afternoon session? We don't. We have morning and then extended days, and uh, we just started an after-school program, um, which is currently K through second grade, and just with the New Canaan Public Schools and their their bus directly to the Nature Center, which is a different need of the town. That uh, is, just, I mean, I could go into that more. Also, we're looking to expand our after-school program for families looking for um, after-school care, which jumps into another another group. But again, we need. 
<clears throat> space to do that. So maintaining the buildings um, and fixing them up and providing more classroom space is uh, definitely part of our future strategic planning. Okay, thanks. We have thanks. a lot more. So thanks, everybody. That's it. Thank you. Next is. Um, as far as the Community Foundation goes, we have a meeting with the leadership of the Community Foundation um, Sunday afternoon, I believe, to talk about this process and how they see that they could, could run it for us. I mean, that's what they're so good at is the grant. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So nice we'll we let you know that. after we have that meeting just what their thoughts are. Thank you, Tucker, and that may be more relevant to that other meeting. Hi, I'm Judy Phillips. I'm here as the Executive Director of New Canaan Cares. It is a pleasure to meet all of you in person, person via Zoom for a change. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, New Canaan Cares has been serving our community for over 40 years. We provide um, education programming for the health and well-being of youth and families, the responsible, responsive educational programs that support positive youth development, strengthen parenting skills, and support healthy life, lifestyles. We empower youth, we strengthen families, and build community. And we don't just take that as a tagline, it's something we live. And that is part of the reason that the ARPA funds and COVID effects are applicable here. We are also, which many of you may not know, we're the state-sponsored local prevention council here in New Canaan. And what that means is that we are responsible for the prevention and education of substance use and abuse in our community with a focus particularly on youth. And a large part of this is addressing the underlying issues such as anxiety um, and those sort of things that have really been more prevalent during the pandemic. The coalition has a representation from a variety of sectors, including local government, schools, businesses, the health and behavioral health care community, youth serving organizations, civic organizations, the media, law enforcement, the faith community, youth and parents. So as you can see, we have a little bit of everybody informing us on that local prevention council. So as Bill shared with you, we did have a meeting this morning among the executive directors, and there is a lot of confusion on how this process is going to work with that million dollars. Will there be informed input from the town council on how you want those funds spent, um, or will it be entirely up to the community foundation? So that kind of um, uncertainty informs what I'm going to share with you tonight. And um, so one of the things that we think is vitally important is addressing the underlying issues that are leading into everything. So one of, the, one of the many things we've seen when we have myriad ways we could use ARPA funds to address that, but I'm going to share three particular examples with you tonight. One is our preschool and elementary school kids have either not developed social emotional skills and social skills or they've fallen behind or forgotten how to use them. So we'd like to work with them in small groups and teach those skills and then provide the parents those skills to translate that at home because you, you're, we're going backwards. So you have parents who are frustrated that have, may have gone through this, but how do they do it again in a way that's meaningful? Um, also, we think it's vitally important that we're working with all of our youth and families throughout the community to address the underlying issues. So one of the things we'd like to see happen is have a community-wide program with a speaker that is relevant, relevant across all spectrums and then break that down into smaller workshops focused on seniors or parents or, or the youth or those parents who are working with the youth and the seniors. And to address it from various levels so that they can we can dive deeper into those things, but then also work with people in a safe environment to practice those skills. Because how many of you have sat at a workshop and said, okay, here's, here's what you do, this is how you do that. And you've gone home and tried to implement something and you're like, this isn't working, how do I readjust? So working through those and providing that network for people and almost like a mentoring program for people to work through those things. Third is we think it's vitally important to have intergenerational programming because the pandemic's affected absolutely all of us from our youth to, as I said, our parents who are working with their youth. They're trying to figure life out for themselves. Then they're also oftentimes trying to work with their senior parents. 
And then you have the seniors who, like much of our youth, have lost those social emotional skills because they've been so isolated. So they haven't been able to practice it and have gone deeper into themselves. So with intergenerational programming, we're helping our youngsters learn and practice those skills, bringing those back and providing a very meaningful role for our senior citizens and then also helping the parents bridge both gaps. So those are just some of the, the smaller, you know, so a small sample of the ideas we have that we'd like to see happen. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize, as Bill said, is that there are, we have an amazing community of nonprofits. And what we would like to do is collaborate with each of them in our role as the LPC, because we do have that reach. We also work with a variety of organizations currently. So we would like to expand that and see that earmarked within the grant as social emotional health is something that needs to be addressed in the ARPA process. Does anyone have a question at this point? So I, um, so I want to get to the first point you made, which is um, there's some confusion among the nonprofits. Um, for us as well, you know, nobody gave us a roadmap. Uh, you know, the first roadmap was was Kevin's attempt to, you know, allocate, and uh, I think it was based on our input to Kevin and the selectmen that the New Canaan Community Foundation has the best process in place for evaluating proposals like the ones you've made. We just wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity here to um, to hear from everybody. For those who who, uh, who do not feel like that process is for them, you know, they have an opportunity to come to us directly. Um, I we're going to be very curious to find out what that what the what that meeting uh, produces on Thursday. Whether they feel that they have a process in place they could uh, effectively deploy a million dollars or two million, you know, or whatever number. Um, I mean, so, you know, we, we'd like to hear what they're capable of. And on the same token, we wanna hear from the nonprofits, whether they feel like that is the right process for them. So- um, And I will comment on that. I think the Community Foundation is beautifully situated. We already work with them through the grant process. They're familiar with a lot of the nonprofits in town. Um, I think from the nonprofit perspective, just having a structure, as Bill said, of what the priorities are and where to make informed asks from that I process. Bet if you ask each of us, you'd get a different answer on the priorities. So we're right. gonna we'll get back to you on that. Go ahead. But, <laughs> but what what we're trying to do, and this kind of touches on Bill's comments, because I know you're confused and we're a little bit confused, but we're trying to at least put some parameters around this because, and this then touches on what Chris was saying, which is we're just looking at it from top down, from a high level. We're not experts and we don't want to pick winners and losers, but we do want to set parameters. That's hopefully, that's my goal. If there's nothing that comes of it, it my only concern for the town council is that we set parameters because I don't think it just to hand a, a matrix to us right now with projects is really not going to help our cause. Uh, we're not going to get to a decision. And I, I don't think we should be talking about painting Vine Cottage when we should be setting parameters. So hopefully, just understand that, that is, that's at least where I'm going. No, totally I, agree. I, and I hope, you know, my goal is to hopefully get, get my colleagues to, uh, my fellow members to agree hopefully <laughs> that that should but be our goal I, th I think our goal is as as the appropriations come forward we have to approve the appropriations mm -hmm. and and if they come forward and not appropriations that are consistent with where we believe this should be going it's going to be a problem and so i think it's it's incumbent upon us to get to the community foundation and get to everybody in town and make sure that we're putting together uh, what we believe as the town council has to approve the appropriations is going to be the best use of the money. And we're not there yet, which is everybody's frustration, right? We don't have a process and we, and we don't have the parameters, but, but we understand that we need yeah. to figure it out. Thank you. But we are listening and learning. Yeah. And that is greatly appreciated. Thank you. So and we're just for my own education, what is the name of the organization that met this morning and was discussing this? Uh, it, it's a group of executive directors. Uh, okay. We meet on a quarterly basis currently, and it's put together by the community fund. They they or, they facilitate it for us, um, and we get together 
on a regular basis and discuss a variety of topics. And it's from everything from what events we're all doing, what's working for us. Um, it, it's a peer networking group, basically. Okay. Nice. Had no idea it occurred and or what it even is. And so it's nice to know that that exists and having organizations, uh, executive directors get together and to network with one another is really very important. <clears throat> And I, I have another question, but it has to do uh, uh, to, to, to Tucker. When is this meeting with the Community Foundation and when was it uh, pulled together? And because we know nothing about it. <clears throat> it was not a request of the Community Foundation. Laura Patterson has been out on her So she hasn't, she's been following along, but obviously she's you know got other things on her mind and other things occupying her time. The leadership, so John Knight and Lauren reached out and asked if they could just have a preliminary meeting with, with Kevin and myself um, just to discuss what they, again, they're trying to put parameters around it. They want to make sure this is not where anything is going to get defined. It was just more that they could discuss the process with us, and then we could, um, uh, you know, think about it and, and get it all back to you all in whatever whatever the outcome of that meeting is. I'm not entirely okay, sure. Okay, because I'm, I'm a little confused on the chicken and the egg concept here. So Who's establishing Lauren, parameter, parameters? Because I thought we were meeting to establish the right, parameters of what we're think, going to be evaluating. Before Lauren went on maternity leave, she was actually, she hosted, she co-hosted the forum <laughs> in July. It was TDAC, the Community Foundation, and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and she provided all the listening, you know, the meeting notes and all of that. She, um, was part of the discussions of us talking about should we put aside a, a, you know some of this these funds for the community foundation to help us allocate she was completely on board she and i talked most recently about it asked if she thought a million dollars was an appropriate amount was it too much too little she thought given the time period that it was an appropriate amount two weeks passed and then we john knight asked for this meeting so and i believe john might even be on the call tonight if he wants to um speak up to this i'm not sure if he's um who's john john knight he's on the board at the community foundation i think we have our answer let's move on to the next speaker okay thank you, thank you. who's next all right Moving. i'm john mclean I've lived up on Smith Ridge for about 45 years. And tonight I represent the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 653. This is our 100th year in the town of New Canaan, serving New Canaan. Everybody thinks of veterans of uh, being uh, uh, old men with canes slobbering on themselves at this point in time. Uh, I want you to know I haven't slobbered on myself for a long time. I'm 77 years old. We have our oldest member is 95 year old veteran of the Battle of the Bulge. Um, we have one, I'm not looking for any capital expenditure help here. It's just a budget issue. We have, we spent a lot of money the last few years, especially with the plaques that everybody walked by when they came in the building. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, our main project, our main expense for the year is actually $12,000 for the wreaths that we put on every veteran's grave, all 12,000 of them in the town of New Canaan every year. We also put flags on every grave and we usually have more than a couple hundred people out there twice a year doing this. It's a big town event now. Uh, between those two things and then organizing the uh, Memorial Day Parade, <coughs> uh, those are our, our big efforts. We also uh, have uh, members go to schools every Veterans Day and talk to the kids about uh, the military, what the military service is like, what it's all about. Of course, I can't talk to them too much with too much uh, uh, relative history because I've been out of the service now for about 53 years. But uh, it costs us about $12,000 to buy the wreaths alone. And we buy them from the exchange club. 
to keep it in town. Uh, so this is the first year we've really gone out to raise funds because usually we are able to get it when we pass out poppies at Memorial Day. Most people don't even understand what those are anymore, but we try to educate them on what they are. And we look for, uh, whether it's a quarter here or a dollar there, to raise the funds to pay for what is about, last year was about 15,000. Uh, it's about 15,000 this year. Next year will probably be about 17,000. That's, that's our, our whole budget. So I'm not asking for half a million dollars or anything else, but being able to put the wreaths on the, 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 the graves of the guys that can't be here to talk to you today is very important to us. So if you could help, we would appreciate it any way you can. Uh, full disclosure, I went through the process at the New Canaan Community Foundation last week. It's not an easy process. Uh, they ask for an awful lot of detail. Uh, which uh, was not difficult for us because, I mean, our last meeting, we had 11 guys, okay? okay? So we don't have a very large organization with a very large budget. So it was pretty easy to put it all together, but it took me about a week, all right? So that's it. What kind of questions do you have? More thanks than questions. Yeah. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, we sure help you guys out getting the reeds out into some of the far corners of town and uh, getting the flags out on Memorial Day. So thanks for what you do. I'd like to see you guys out there too. Come on out and help. Come on and help the kids. Talk to We're them. We're out there. Talk I visit the schools. I talk to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's good that the kids understand this stuff. <clears throat> learn about it. And look at some guy's grave. Shows, you know, I mean, our post has got two names on it now. It used to have one name on it from a World War I one veteran. Now it also has Peter Langes' name on it because he passed about a year and a half ago. Good man. I've had more people compliment those plaques down in the in the lobby there. I mean, it's just that's an amazing thing that that was done, and that'll be there forever. And it's really you stand there and you look look at those plaques. That's an impressive display yeah. in this town. Maybe we could. Maybe that's the place where we could collect money um, for for the veterans for this twelve thousand dollar you know budget every year i mean if people are impressed you know they, they have their events memorial day and they give out the poppies but you have a lot of people passing in and out of town hall all the time and maybe there is periodically either you know an education place and a collection basket that we can collect yeah. for for the vfw post 653 um and and sensitize people toward this budget, this effort, and they can either collect donations of money or donations of time, you know, to help with the wreaths and the flags. So bringing awareness is important. Bringing awareness. Maybe town hall can help you bring the awareness, either it. in our lobby yeah, what, what, or through our communications. Whatever you can do, we, we appreciate because it's been kind of tough the last couple of years. And well, you know, we're, you're on channel 79 right now. So I'm sure that donations are going to double as a result of this <laughs> must see TV. I'm not laughing. Okay. Thank Where you. do the donations go to? Uh, post 653 VFW. And is that located in on Main Street? In the oh, well, we've, we've got a, a post office box. And okay. I, it's post six five. It's post office box six five three, New Canaan, Connecticut. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Who's up next, Tuck? Tuck? Meg. All right. Thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm Meg Walsh. I've not been in this room before, so um, I'll just introduce myself quickly. I am currently um, am here because I work at Grace Farms on the strategic partnerships team there, but I'm also a resident of New Canaan. I have four young kids here who've gone to the Nature Center, and I've been involved with their schools and a lot of, uh, actually been on the board of the Nature Center and other community organizations here in town. Um, but just recently started working at Grace Farms after running a corporate foundation. So I understand some of the issues you're grappling with, with the you know incredibly meaningful causes across the board. Um, but tonight I'm here for Grace Farms. 
<clears throat> and I'm sure everyone knows, but just in case people aren't aware, um, I'll give a little information about Grace Farm so you can understand our perspective on how you know we think these funds could be put to great use. Um, so Grace Farms is an incredible nonprofit cultural and humanitarian center right here in New Canaan. The mission of Grace Farms is to pursue peace through five initiatives, nature, arts, justice, faith, and community, and to do all those things through this incredibly um, beautiful preserved site of 80 acres in New Canaan, with a, obviously a beautiful architectural gem on that site as well. Um, so there are lots of ways that Grace Farms can give back to this community, and some of them you've probably seen in the news throughout the pandemic. Um, but first, something that we've done with a lot of the nonprofits here tonight are space grants. We invite nonprofits um, in past years, pre-COVID, it was 30 to 50 nonprofit organizations per year coming to Grace Farms, just like uh, you know, a regular grant process, applying for a space grant to come and use the site and to convene with other nonprofits. Um, examples that we've had are Staying Put, New Canaan Library, New Canaan Cares, Mounted Troop, a lot of different beneficiaries. Um, and then also Grace Farm serves as a place for convening. So those nonprofits and other nonprofits and then cross-sector convenings with government institutions and um, business institutions as well. And then um, examples of other partnerships that Grace Farms is able to engage uh, with the community on, which inform our perspective. Here are a few. One is something you probably all know about, the COVID-19 Relief Fund. Um, while we had to close for public safety and we had to forego two of our annual benefits, which typically raise about $400,000 to $500,000 each, the organization, which I've, I've just now joined, um, was busy responding to the crisis with all the resources that it had um, and trying to keep the community supported and keep people employed there. Um, I'll talk about this in a second, but Grace Farms has about 90 employees, um, including people who live in New Canaan. Uh, but through that partnership and that pandemic response that we were able to do with the town and other partners, there was 2 million pieces of PPE distributed, sourced and distributed at a time when that was really hard to find and, and New Canaan was at the heart of that from a statewide perspective. Um, to, as of last week, uh, 288,000 pounds of food have been provided to a network of 11 nonprofit partners, including Staying Put right here in New Canaan. And through that, uh, you know, whole fund, we worked with 64 different organizations and towns, again, putting New Canaan on the map in that way. And then the, another great example of um, a way that Grace Farms, along with its partner organizations here in town, can put New Canaan on the map is through um, partnerships around cultural um, and humanitarian causes. So right now you probably know is New Canaan's October for Design, and I think other people may, may speak about this, but um, Right now, Glass House, excuse me, uh, Grace Farms is partnering with New Canaan Museum and Historical Society and other groups like Glass House, uh, participating in a modern house tour, um, bringing incredible uh, diversity scholars and artists here to New Canaan. Um, I, I worked at Grace Farms a couple of weekends because we obviously just reopened to the public and people are coming from New York City, New Jersey, lots of towns in Fairfield County. and driving an hour and a half, two hours here to New Canaan for these arts and cultural organizations. Um, there's so much more that I can say, but I think I'll just end on the um, important uh, role that Grace Farms and these cultural organizations have for individuals. As a person who moved to town only eight years ago and who has young kids, um, I'm seeing after being at New, uh, Grace Farms for a year that it catalyzes people who want to visit or move here. Um, contributes to New Canaan being a fantastic place to live. It's partly why they selected this town. Um, you know, expanding programming at all of our organizations. Just one data point is we recently launched a membership program within a couple weeks, like two or three weeks of launching this program. We have over 250 people who want to be members at Grace Farms and you only purchase the membership because you want to come back. So it's bringing families here um, who want to live here and also who just want to visit and come back, you know, as others were saying, come into town and grab lunch or have dinner and, and stay for a show. Um, so it's a great way for all of us to work together. Um, in closing, I'll just say it's exciting to have a chance to position New Canaan to emerge from COVID stronger than we were, to work together to um, ensure that New Canaan has a continued reputation as a town with cultural, architectural, and humanitarian significance. So thanks so much for the time and happy to field questions. Thanks so much for coming. I specifically re reached out to Grace Farms because they were, this is, this ARPA money is COVID related and they did so much at Grace Farms during COVID. And like the Community Foundation, they touched, I think you said 90 nonprofits, 90 
all of the nonprofits. So I thought it was very important to hear that Grace Farms perspective. You guys never ask for money, but I wanted to hear what you thought. So I'm going to ask you, and you don't have to answer right away when I put you on the spot, but how should we be thinking about, you know, the parameters? You guys are pretty good at setting parameters. You set your own five axis. And when the uh, world changed, you shifted your focus from a, a campus-based solution to getting off the campus. So I'm going to continue to ask you guys, you know, how should we be the town council? How should we, the community? Because you're touching every aspect of this community. And I'm not sure a lot of people know that. So not going to put you on the spot, but just wanted to thank you, ask your perspective, and, uh, and hear what you guys have been working on lately. So. Well, we're happy to work with the organizations in the room and all of you. And I, that's what I found in my previous experience too, was you really have to do what you're doing tonight. Get, you know, get consensus. Where are all the interests of veterans? Is it environmental? And um, work together around maybe, you know, like you said, an approach that Grace Farms has with five different focus areas and then the subsets in there. So happy to contribute to that um, process. Anyway, Thank you. Can. Sure. Thanks for coming tonight. Sure. Okay. Margaret Riley. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Margaret Riley. I'm the executive director of New Canaan YMCA. Thank you for your time this evening and thank you for this opportunity to discuss how the town can allocate the ARPA funds. Um, I think you know what I'm here for. <laughs> we are interested in expanding the WISE Child Care Program. Um, we have been the wise the wise child care program is the tom hargrove and dr anita grover child development center we operate two programs the first we call rainbow station that serves children from six weeks old up until four years old so from infancy through preschool the second program we run is kids unlimited it's an after school program we serve children from kindergarten through sixth grade we have been operating these state licensed programs since the 1980s. And for over a decade now, we've been operating them with wait lists. We have wait lists for our after school program, around 30 to 50 children. And for our preschool uh, programs and our infant programs, the numbers can go as high as 150 people because the, the lists stay year after year after year. There has, I don't think I need to convince you of the need for additional child care in New Canaan. I think we all appreciate that there's a need. It's something that was recognized and even discussed in, among the town back in 2019. Um, and the why considered embarking on an expansion program then. Um, we, due to COVID and the financial challenges that it's presented, the why would have a difficult time doing it now without the town's assistance. We have engaged an architect to do a feasibility study for us to look at our building to see what opportunities there are to expand our child care program within our current facility. The architect specializes in child care design and she has put together a preliminary plan that would allow us to expand our current service from 116 children to 168 children. So that's a 45% increase in the capacity of our program. The WISE program is unique from other childcare in town in many respects. First, with respect to the age of children that we serve, we serve children from six weeks old up until sixth grade. Second, with respect to the hours that we run our program, our program is open and available to families from 7.30 in the morning until six at night. We run our program year round. It's not on a school schedule, it's all year. And we assist families with school vacations and holidays. Finally, our program is unique because we offer enrichment opportunities for the children who participate. If you come to childcare at the Y, you learn to swim. You can engage in our gymnastics programs. You, you play sports. Uh, it's really a unique opportunity to be part of the WISE programs for years, from your infancy through your preteen years. How will this expansion foster economic development and COVID recovery? It, allowing us to expand our child care program will put more families to work in New Canaan. Whether you're working from home or trying to commute, it's almost impossible to do if you've also got to take care of young children simultaneously. It also allows town businesses to hire additional employees. People who work 
like to have their child care in the same town in which they work. They'd like to drop off their children and then be at the office or their retail store or restaurant within minutes of dropping off their children. They like to be nearby their children during the day. And on the way home, they like to be back to their children within minutes of leaving work. So it will allow our town to hire more employees more readily. It supports employment in town. The Y hires teachers that can be retirees or young adults. And in our after school program, we employ a large number of high school students, teenagers within our town. And finally, the expansion would help to strengthen the YMCA. Like the New Canaan Library, like many of the organizations in town, the YMCA impacts every person in this community. There is no one who cannot find a use for the YMCA services. We serve people from infancy through throughout their entire lives. Um, programs for people who have uh, illnesses such as cancer, cancer. Um, people who are rehabilitating or are training for triathlons. Uh, we offer services for everyone and we offer financial assistance for everyone so that no one is denied the opportunity to either participate in the Y's child care program or any of the programs at the Y or even be a member at the Y. With respect to the expense of the program, the preliminary estimate that I have from our architect is $1.4 million. Um, we have additionally received some funds from the Child Care Stabilization Fund. That's approximately $100,000 after the amount that needed to be earmarked for compensation for child care. Um, we know that the federal government is considering an infrastructure bill that will likely provide funds for expansion of child care uh, services. The YMCA, because it's a national organization, um, employs lobbyists and has um, advisors to help local YMCAs to know how to apply for funds and what programs are likely to be approved so that we can be ready to apply for those funds and receive additional funds as soon as they become available. So we have support to help us to gain those additional funds. Uh, further, we have very generous donors who have supported our child care programs in the past, and we would be also soliciting soliciting donations from individuals. So I think that this is a very worthwhile, much needed program within the town of New Canaan. I think that the YMCA is poised as a, as a program already established, already licensed, already experienced and long running to, to expand quickly and readily and to support this very important need in our town. Wow. <laughs> Drop the mic and leave, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you hit all the, you know, you hit all the points that we needed to hear. Um, I mean, you know, it, it is broad reaching. It is something we need now. So it's not something we could do five years from now. Uh, it is public dollars uh, married up, you know, 250, according to this sheet, $250,000 of New Canaan money is only part of a $1.4 million project. So we're putting a minority in, but it's being matched you can feel free several to increase times that over. amount if you think it appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was going to be one of my questions. I mean, if we gave twice as much money, could you expand the program twice as much. I mean, why stop at 168? You've got these 150 on the one waiting <laughs> list and 30 on the other. Well, we've got a big building. Yes. And so you're right. We, we could. I would think that that is the limitation is that the, the, the neighborhood <laughs> is going to say at, at some point, you know, we, well, we're not adding, too we're not adding to our footprint. No we're more, not expanding okay. our building. This is all within our four walls that are already there. So it's, it's a repurposing of current space. Okay. You don't have any room in the parking lot to put all these extra people <laughs> on the waiting list. We well, have room in our parking lot. Now. I'm sure your architect <laughs> will figure that out. Any yes. questions? I have a question. Just like the Y holds the camp at uh, Kiwanis Park, which is a different facility, mm -hmm. would you be able to provide the service of child care in another facility? We could. Um, it's it's 
you know, childcare is interesting though, and I'm learning this myself as we go along, and especially as I spoke to this architect who specializes in this design. For instance, an infant service room needs to be situated differently than a toddler room. You're talking about restroom facilities need to look differently. There have to be a certain number of sinks. So there would still be outfitting that might need to be done if you found a space, unless it were already childcare ready. So there would still be some expenses. Also, really our program, what makes it so ideal is that families often have multiple children within our program. So you have your infant there, and then you also have a four-year-old, and you may also have someone for after school. And the parents love not only that the kids can have those activities that I spoke of, but that they're all in one place. That's so if we sure. just would expand to say off-site for infants, we wouldn't then have the same uh, convenience to parents. Um, additionally, they wouldn't, they wouldn't still take, be able to take uh, advantage of those additional programs like swimming, for instance, if they were offsite. So, so it's nice to have everyone centralized and to have all of those programs accessible. I think that's one of the reasons that makes our, our program so popular is that we do offer so much to children there. Okay, thank you. Is there overlap between your programs and Bill's programs? Because I get a little confused because we're talking about little kids and infants and, you know. Um, to some I mean, extent, yes. The preschool programs, there is some overlap. Um, our hours are different, though. I, I think that the, and he'll correct me, I think that the Nature Center program is more um, school calendar based. And I think that their hours are more abbreviated than, than ours. Ours go from a full day so that someone could really, you could be a commuter and utilize the WISE child care program from 7 and 7.30 in the morning until 6 in the evening. It's a full day. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you again thank you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? That is a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nancy Geary. I'm the executive director of the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society, and thank you for inviting me to come talk. Um, I've thought a lot about what to ask for, and I want to talk to you tonight about October for Design. Um, two and a half years ago, the New Canaan Museum, and well, I participated in TDAC, and a lot of the conversations were what makes New Canaan special and then what makes you Can New Canaan unique? And so many of those conversations kept coming back to, it's the architecture, it's the history of design. Elliot Noyes had his industrial design here. The Harvard Five architects are here. Um, more recent New Canaanites have published books on this rich history and culture. How can we take what the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society has been doing for 20 years in its biennial house tour and make it more of an initiative that will wrap its arms around all of the nonprofits, all of the businesses, the retailers, the restaurants, everything. And- um, Sorry, that, I couldn't quite hear you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Siri heard um, you. Anyway, so that's, that's sort of how the impetus for October for Design came around. And um, TDAC and through the town recommended and funded the initial graphic design work of year one. COVID hit. Year one was actually kind of, it was a soft sell, but we had some wonderful partnerships with the library. We had some architectural programs via Zoom. Um, it worked. This year, uh, we went full bore. And I'm very, can I do a handout? Okay, so this is hot off the press today. And this is the result of um, TDAC requested that we have a handout last week. And we put this together. Not everybody was included, um, but everybody who responded to our emails. See that, Bill? You should have had handouts. <laughs> uh, everybody that responded promptly, but we were able to get in so that we could get it printed quickly, because obviously the program started on the first. Um, and this is just one year's efforts. All of this year's efforts have been funded by the Museum and Historical Society. And we'll see what happened, but I just wanna give you just a few numbers. For example, all of the programs that require tickets are already sold out. Um, we have people coming from, I think, 34 different zip codes. We have a group of 25, including the executive director of Palm Springs Modernism coming from Palm Springs. We are bringing in tourists from New York, um, Brooklyn, New York City, Brooklyn, 
Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and I'm just getting this because I see their addresses when they buy the tickets. Um, everybody has to stay someplace if they've come from a distance. Everybody needs to eat and shop. Um, and it, you know, in the case of the Palm Springs group, they're actually coming for five days. So um, one of the things, one of the events on here is apparently the first ever gallery stroll in town. So that's been organized by Heather Gaddio and Cass Fries and um, the Handwrite Gallery. So it, it's not just the Historical Society. Obviously, we're doing a lot of programming. We've organized not only our house tours, but we have Fred Noyes talking at the Historical Society tonight with Gordon Bruce, who wrote this incredible book about Elliot Noyes. Um, I was just approached at the program on Saturday about the publisher for Monticelli Press, who wants to do author talks here because of this now. We, it's, it's really a very, um, the, the reach is, is sort of limitless. I mean, we can expand as much as we can do with existing staff and volunteers. Um, the problem, honestly, is that the graphics, the website, all of that stuff is very, very expensive to run. And we certainly could have done more with marketing, you know, if we'd had the funds. So I'm here to ask you to consider funding or contributing to funding uh, the next two years. We have the biennial house tour. So uh, of October for design. Of October for design. Um, obviously, it would be a partnership with the Historical Society because we're already committed to spending a lot of our money on, on making this grow. And I'm hoping that as more community partners come in, it would really it could really be a town community partnership with you know other nonprofits and other businesses who want to do things, contributing more of the overhead um, to fund it. But it, it is, I think it is really a way to showcase the town that shows how special it is. It's also a way to drive business and tourism. Um, and it's also just really fun. You know, you go to some of the programs and there's a sense of this community of all the people that have loved art and architecture and design are looking both forward and backward and the rich history here. So I hope you'll consider um, making sure that we can really get this um, growing and established, which will, you know, after this year, we, we can only go bigger. So. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I, a I lot of the reflect, programs are you know free. What? You and I have had a, a brief conversation before tonight, and I, and I know that you've been struggling with this because I know that when you look around at the many needs of the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society, there's you know, a broken carriage, there's a textile uh, collection, there's, there's so many things. So I am a little surprised, but I am delighted that what you, when you, when you finally, you know, had a moment of peace and you surveyed all the different needs, you said, you know what, I'm not going to try and fix a broken roof or something. I'm going to figure out what is the best asset we have that's making the biggest impact outside our community and within our community. And I'm going to invest in success. That's what I heard you just say, that there's all these other things that we could be doing, but this is our greatest success and we're, we should double it. We should continue to grow the thing that people are coming to this town for. That's what I heard you say. And I will say among all these things on the list, this is, you know, we, we said early on that TDAC was one of the four important, you know, uh, tourism and economic development. And most of these things, you know, a, a, a flexi path trail around Mead Park, most, none of these other things really address the TDAC uh, axis. But you just did for the first time. I'm, I won't say nobody, you know, looked outside our community, but this this idea of yours looks primarily outside our community. And it is one of the parameters. It was one of the parameters that the federal government said is, you know, we want you to invest in things that will grow. And so I think this is a great idea. And I hope that you will develop this idea. I mean, you've said 
fund the next two years, but we should put some meat on the bones. I, really, look, I can give you very specifics because we sure. spent a lot of money. And you don't and have to all, do that right yeah. now, but so you know. I mean, in terms of in terms of what you would choose to invest as part of this program, you know, we could break it out however you wanted to break it out. You spend five minutes with Chris Shipper, he'll show you how to get up to two million dollars. I mean, you know, <laughs> we'll put some meat on the bone, but you know, um, what's the need and what's the ask? Yeah, I think saying two years of this program is a good start, but I think we're going to have to at some point put in, you know, a dollar amount on the sheet. Well, I mean, if you yeah. wanted a dollar, I was coming here prepared to ask you for a hundred thousand dollars, which would be fifty thousand over two years. You know, for two years, okay. you could, you could. I mean, I know this is not supposed to be something that's a recurring fund, so I would ask that you would give it to us, and that's how we would spend it. There may be aspects of this of this, um, how we build this, that we may spend more in year one because it will last us for one and two. Um, we'd have to really look at that. In terms of the marketing, I think that anything we do in year one is going to carry over. Um, Live New Canaan just picked this up last week. They ran a blog. Um, you know, I don't know because we didn't ask people when they showed up whether they came because of that. But I mean, there's a lot of things that already exist in this town that we could that we could either partner with or have them support us. You know, a lot of the infrastructure is here. We just need to we just need more manpower and we need you know more participation. And could uh, it's probably a difficult question, but on the economics, some of these we talk about public private partnership and we talk about how much ours is being matched by the community. I would I would expect that the hundred thousand dollars you're asking us to contribute is probably matched three or four times over by what you're already spending and the community is already spending on October for design. Yeah, and just just as a brief example, the the 10 minute movie we produced called Three Iconic Houses, which is on the Shivas house, the Blasnas house and the Edward Durrell Stone Selenese house um, was ten was five thousand dollars for three minutes. Um, but it was a beautiful film and Palm Springs Modernism accepted it into their online program and was watched by, you know, thousands of people around the world. Those people want to now come and see those houses, their private homes. But the other thing I wanted to say is that you all have just invested in the Gorius Pavilion, which other than the um, Glass House is the only public mid-century modern building. Um, and what we could do with that I mean, I was thinking it could even be the center for October for Design. It's such a natural building to be a sort of tourist information center for the month. So, and that's already underway. Great, do it. Do it. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, thank Nancy, you very much. Thank this you. Is, this, it's amazing. All of this is happening in this town in one month. It's well, and, and kudos to Gina Federico, who literally designed this in 24 hours. <laughs> cool. So. Very Thank impressive. you. Thanks. Thank you. Lori Kelly, uh, the city of Ryerson. Hi. Am I on? Yes. Okay. okay. I'm your first Zoom participant, and it's only fitting because I am representing a an electronic program. Uh, the one that was just mentioned by Nancy Geary, and I thank you for that segue. Um, what, I'm, what I would like to talk to you about today is the Live New Canaan program. It is a thoroughly integrated marketing and promotional program for New Canaan that was developed three years ago by the New Canaan Board of Realtors. I'm the executive officer of the New Canaan Board of Realtors. And unlike many of the organizations that you've seen here tonight, we are a 501c6, like the Chamber of Commerce, not a 501c3. So the way that our funds are raised is through membership dues, and the, the realtors in New Canaan are members of the Board of Realtors. So the centerpiece um, of the Live New Canaan program is our website, livenewcanaan.org. And I think uh, Tucker's going to allow me to screen share that in just a moment. But I'm going to tell you that what it contains, first of all, is profiles and news about three, about more than 300 businesses and organizations in town. It's searchable by categories like shopping, services, goods, exploration, dining, eating in, grabbing and go, and schools. The website also features compelling video testimonials by, piece, by people who recently moved to New Canaan a rich news section with feature stories about the town, its schools, businesses, and organizations, 
a monthly calendar of events by businesses and organizations in the town, and a searchable real estate section where potential home buyers can find houses and realtors. Now we started this program when the real estate market was lagging, but it's become all the more important during COVID when so many people were looking to move from where they were, especially places like Brooklyn, Manhattan, and even California, to a suburb that contained many of the elements that New Canaan has. But we're also in competition with our neighboring towns. And we believe that the Live New Canaan campaign has really given New Canaan a leg up on that. So what, what the program includes is a strong ongoing social media campaign campaign that showcases local businesses station two times two to three times a week on Instagram, Facebook, and other social platforms. Another major feature of the program is a timely, topical, bi-weekly email newsletter, you can tell I didn't write this, that goes to 10,000 local residents and 20,000 people in targeted zip codes where New Canaan home buyers have come from in the past. Furthermore, the, uh, the Live New Canaan program includes paid Google advertising that carries key messages about living in New Canaan to target audiences on the top news platforms. The program also contains ongoing media outreach to local and national outlets. We've been right at the top, above the fold of the Wall Street Journal online, for instance, and gotten some great press in, in all kinds of uh, publications. Um, the Live New, Canaan is backed, Live New Canaan campaign is backed by a powerful search engine optimization effort that drives traffic to the LiveNewCanaan.org website at a dramatic, ever-increasing rate. And while this was founded and funded by realtors, it has never been just about real estate. It's what its, its intention was to showcase the benefits of living here. It's a concentrated town-wide effort that surrounding towns, including Greenwich, Darien, Westport, Stamford, and towns in Westchester County just don't have yet. We've partnered with a great organization that has really gotten us out, in, out ahead of the curb on this. So while some of these other towns have disparate and self-competing platforms, none have an integrated program like Live New Canaan. The campaign is positioned as the resource for all things in Canaan and local businesses are increasingly reliant on the platform in order to be discovered and to grow online, especially critical in this COVID world. In fact, a number of local businesses now come up in a Google search on livenewcanaan.org before they do as their own website. So the New Canaan Board of Realtors has made a nearly $200,000 investment in founding and maintaining this program. And while its benefits have, seen, have been seen in the booming real estate market, since we are a dues-based 501c6 organization whose income has not changed substantially over the years, we are asking uh, respectfully for the town to help us fund this organization. What we're asking for is $60,000 over the next three years, I mean, ideally, I mean, you have to give it to us up front, but we would commit to keeping the program going then. Um, it is the single biggest budget item for the Board of Realtors, and its benefits have gone way beyond its members, bolstering the visibility of hundreds of local businesses and organizations. The Board cannot afford to fully fund the program in perpetuity, and we hope that the partial support of town uh, funding through a $60,000 grant, uh, that through this we may be able to sustain the program uh, for the next three years. And now, um, also the, the other thing that the Board of Realtors does is to give back to all of the other nonprofits in town. I also sit on the group that met this morning for not-for-profit executive directors, and although our needs are somewhat different than the fundraising 501c3s in town. We all work together because success for all, for one of us is success for all of us. So let me see if, uh, Tucker, have you, thank you very much for letting me screen share. I'm just going to pull the, hold on. 
This is the website. Let me see if, um, you know, it, it has, um, I, I don't want it to interfere with me speaking by having its, its um, uh, volume on, but you can see as we scroll through the site, it's got some beautiful photographs and video footage of New Canaan. It's got the ability to find a home, find a place to even drink, find a place to shop, and then it tells you all about our top rated schools, our vibrant walkable town center, or something that I can't see over there right now, um, what our real estate market is like, what our houses are like, our restaurants, our proximity and commutability to New York, our news um, about events going on in New Canaan, like the October design celebration. Here's what's happening during um, October for design, news from the schools. This, this site is updated every day. It's updated with things that we know the audience through our market research, the audience of coming and shopping and living in New Canaan is interested in. We've got some great videos of families and couples who have moved to New Canaan and they talk about why they love it here. And it's just a, it's a terrific program and we think it benefits the town in so many ways. And we'd like to see the town, um, you know, stay on board with us in this effort. Can I answer any questions? I've got one. Uh, what is what are the plans for sustaining this program in the future after the sixty thousand dollars is gone? It, does this become self funding or does this become a, an infrastructure cost? Well, we we can sustain it as long as we can. We have not raised our dues in a long time. We have not fundraised among our members for this. But if it's something that we want to continue, then we'll have to. Um, we'll have to look at those issues. We are competitive with other boards of realtors in the Fairfield County area. A realtor can join anyone. So we have to be careful not to price ourselves out of the market and that we maintain our membership level as it is. We also have a fund at the New Canaan Community Foundation, which has been doing very well. And we, we um, we use that money to fund some of our programs as well. Thank you. And they don't charge for any of the listings on there. So there's no charge for advertising your restaurant or anything? There is not. There has not been in the past. If, if we had to go that sort of a route, we would certainly consider it. But we're, we want to do this as a service for the town of New Canaan because, you know, we benefit from people coming to shop here because then they, they come to want to live here as well. And that benefits our members. And the town has supported this financially in the past through TDAC. Through TDAC. Uh, the town did give us $10,000 of seed money through TDAC um, in our first year, um, but that's all we've received from them to this point. And as I said, we've, we've spent substantially more than that. How long has this program been in effect? Three years. So we've, and we've sort of gone through some different iterations of it as we've discovered what works better than other um, types of advertising, types of platforms. And so we're continually revamping that and adding new categories, new search functions, um, New, new businesses and organizations, we feature them, uh, you know, whenever they start up in town. Also very robust Instagram program, they're mm -hmm. always posting on Instagram. Any other questions? Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Good John. Job. Thank you all. Very impressive. I haven't checked out the website lately, I confess. And so I was, uh, I'm really impressed by what it looks like today. It looks updated, fresh, vibrant. I mean, now I want to go home and dive into the website and, and, and see all the new stuff you, that's on there. So I'm really glad you presented to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Aaron, you're up. 
guess so. everyone will just uh wait till the screen share gets <laughs> dropped down and tucker how many we have a question how many more people do you know of the last aaron leflin is last <laughs> saving work. the best for last um Great. Well, yeah, thank you all for, for taking the time this evening to, to listen to, to me, my fellow nonprofit EDs. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Aaron Leftland. I am the executive director of the New Canaan Land Trust. I've served in this position for a little over four years now. Um, and I'm going to be taking a little bit different approach um, than some of the, the previous speakers in that I'm not necessarily asking for funds for the land trust. I'm, I'm rather asking for New Canaan to reinvest in what is possibly its most al valuable asset, and that is open space and land in town. Um, throughout the last year, year and a half, we've really seen how important open space is for our community and for other communities. Um, and I, I strongly feel that that's only going to continue to be an important asset for us. Um, they've been places for us to get outside, get outdoors, recreate, find solace. Um, outside of the pandemic and in the face of climate change, they've been places where huge amounts of water are stored um, in storm events and wetlands and contribute to less flooding in our community than we're already experiencing. And with greater storms, we're only going to see more severe storms and these wetlands and open spaces where water can, can flow into the ground are going to continue to be really important resources for us. Um, open space also increases land values. I, I think part of the reason so many people have been flocking from New York to, uh, to New Canaan is because we have great parks, we have open space, we have land trusts with trails, and there's places for folks to get outside and to connect with nature. Um, and as uh, Chris Shipper talked about at the start of the presentation, there's also just a whole host of health benefits that come with open space from uh, improved water quality to uh, improved air quality, um, and just the, the sort of uh, innate benefits that come from being outside and, and connecting with nature. <clears throat> so my, my request is uh, to set aside funds to um, let New Canaan capitalize on opportunities when uh, open space uh, acquisitions arise. And so we all know it's very difficult to predict the real estate market. Uh, it's hard to know when a piece of property is going to come up for sale and we need to be able to act quickly. Uh, there's been opportunities in the past where the town or the land trust hasn't been prepared to, um, to, to raise the funds necessary to purchase a piece of land or to accept a gift of land. Part, part of the reason the land trust exists is because the process of acquiring Waveney Park took so long and um, a more sort of nimble entity needed to exist to be able to accept gifts of land um, on a either, either faster basis or um, just with, uh, with um, a, a quicker process. So setting aside funds gives us the opportunity to be able to, to capitalize on those opportunities when they arise. And the other great part about setting aside funds now and, and having those funds available is that they can be leveraged two to five times. Um, in the town of Greenwich, the town just partnered with the, the Greenwich Land Trust to purchase uh, about 72 acres of Aquarian Water Company land. It was a one-to-one -one match. The town shipped in a million dollars in a land trust the land trust raised a million dollars and they were able to get that 72 acres for two, uh, just over $2 million. And here in town, the Silvermine Fowler Preserve is another great example where the town shipped in about $250,000 for a $1.2 million purchase price that was raised through state funds, um, support from the Trust for Public Land and from the New Canaan Land Trust as well. So in whole, it's, it's a great opportunity for the town to be prepared for future land acquisitions, something that's gonna to continue to be important for us. It's an opportunity to leverage the funds that we set aside now and multiply the benefit from those funds. Um, and I think is something really important for the town to be considering uh, reinvesting in what is New Canaan's most valuable asset. Agreed. <laughs> so on the sheet in front of me, there's a $500,000 earmark. Why is that the right number? <laughs> um, I, well, I don't know if there's a right number. That. A question I get a lot of time is, is how much open space do we need? Um, the, just, just based on, on, uh, sort of what, what big parcels remain in town. Um, as Chris mentioned at the start of the presentation, looking at those water company lands, those 10, 20, 50 acre parcels on the North side of town, those are going to be the big conservation opportunities, um, those will probably have over million dollar purchase prices. That's that's no no um, uh, secret. But if the town is prepared with something like five hundred thousand dollars for a million dollar purchase price, the land trust can can work together with the town. We can go out and get external funds, and so that five hundred thousand dollars could be matched for a million, could be matched for two and a half million if we do the same 
uh, sort of calculus is worked out with the Fowler Preserve. So um, I don't think 500,000 is gonna is gonna purchase a, a huge block of land, but it can certainly be leveraged to do so. Well, how much did the town contribute toward the Fowler 1.2? Uh, the purchase price of Fowler was 1.2. I believe the town contributed to 35, 230, something in there. Okay. Under a quarter. Yeah. And the, and the state also contributed something. Yeah, the state was about 535, and then the land trust and trust for public land raised the difference. Anyone else? How much um, open space is there in the Canaan currently? Uh, do you, protected open protected. space or sort of what we're looking at for the future? Protected non water company land. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head. I, I wish I did. The land trust has protected about 400 acres. I believe the town has has something comparable between all of the, the parks and things like that. Um, the land trust has just uh, released uh, within the last year, a new strategic conservation plan, which identifies close to a thousand acres of open space that could be protected in the future. And that's a combination of water company lands and undeveloped lots or um, parcels that are adjacent to existing parks or land trust properties that could be sort of subdivided, carved off and added to those existing networks of parks. We're never gonna get the eleven percent. No further questions. Thanks. And how much have we contributed to our open space fund since it was created by the town council three years ago? Three years ago. I don't think we funded it at all the first year. I think we asked for two hundred thousand, and we ended up funding nothing. Didn't make its way through the board of finance last year. Did we contribute fifty thousand? Yeah, I think it was fifty the the second and third year. Yeah. So after three years, are we at fifty thousand? I think we're at a hundred now. Hundred. Yeah. So it's a, it's a hard question, but why do you think we're not more successful at funding open space till now? Why is it taking something like ARPA for there to be a, a big number on the page? Um, I, I think it's because it's one of those things that's hard hard to plan for. Um, people want to know exactly what the funds are going to be used for. And in the case of open space, we, we just don't know when a water company might put land up for sale. Uh, that was the case with the Aquarian property near Indian Waters uh, was that two, three years ago, kind of out of the blue came up for sale and was purchased and is now being cut and developed. And, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to set aside funds knowing, uh, not knowing exactly what it's going to be used for. Um, but I think it's really important for folks to understand that being prepared for that inevitable, uh, purchase or acquisition of land, uh, is really important and really the only way to do conservation. There's, there's not going to be a buyer who's going to say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you five years to raise the money to, to purchase the property. Um, you've got to be able to act quickly and, and be competitive. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. No more speakers? Do you all want to talk to each other now? Or do you want to go home? <laughs> I mean, you've heard from me what I think. You've heard from Mark Jimsky say, we have to put some parameters in place. And that's in response to people like Bill Flynn, who said, we'd really like to know, based on what you've heard, what's important to the town council. Now, we've heard what's important to Kevin um, when I, I leaned over the other night and asked Tucker, where did that number come from? And Tucker leaned over to me and said, I think he made that number up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, in, in all, in, it sounds bad. But in in all in all seriousness, that is probably how it feels to some of the 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 citizens out there. They're like, "How come this number is this number?" You know, I mean, where did this come from? It's not not always based on a demonstrated need. A lot of these numbers did come from discussions. Once the ARPA funds became available, people started, I'm sure, speaking to you all as well and said, "I have an idea for this." And right. That. I mean, I see a combination of VFW, very specific, fifteen thousand dollars, you know. Um, but then I see two hundred and fifty thousand or five hundred thousand, and obviously those are earmarks and one mil one million, right, to the community foundation. 
So does anybody want to reflect on how you feel about earmarks, generally speaking? Well, should we start this one? Go ahead. Sure. No, I, I, I mean, listening tonight to everyone speak, I mean, I, I mean, it, I liked everything I, I heard. Um, you know, Chris brought up a lot of good points and Patricia, I mean, Waveney's like Tanglewood when I, when I think of what you could do to that. Excuse me. Yeah, Patricia, what you could do to that building. Um, Bill talked about a lot of good things. However, it, we need the parameters because I could also find reasons why something shouldn't be allowed in the spirit of the ARPA legislation. Because maybe I could argue that we should be funding that through our budget every year. Here, here. Right. Um, you know, the land trust or stuff like that. I mean, you can make an argument. I, I don't know, but if we all agree to set parameters, I think instead of throwing the net out, we create a circle and say, oh, well, that fits into it. Yep. Totally that, agree. That agree. should be our goal as opposed to, I'm not good, I'm not smart enough to allocate six million dollars to all these wonderful organizations in town but i think if we set parameters it'll come to us i think that one important point you brought up is some of the things that have been presented should be considered part of the budget mm -hmm. and brought up and supported every every year just because it supports new canaan as a whole and improves the quality of life but um i Great. think that the parameters are very important but in listening to the presentations that brings out how many different directions it can take. And I think we have to hone in on what we really want to impact right. with the monies and take it from there. But I have to be honest and say that there was something that was said at the last meeting that really concerns me. And that is that Kevin mentioned that it would be treated as an appropriation and it would go from his office to the Board of Finance to town council Therefore, we only have the ability to cut, cut or, or refuse it. But what impact do we have? And I thought that it was clear when he presented it to us that it was up to the town council to decide. So it also brings more concerns in hearing Tucker say that they're meeting with the community foundation and we're totally excluded. So that is another issue that comes to surface. I don't wanna spin my wheels and, and everybody else and waste everybody's time listening when we are may not be uh, able to make that decision. Okay, I'll uh, I'll debate this with you I'll, okay. I'll, uh, because it's I think it's very important. Um, you're not the only one who felt that way. They're like, hey, wait a minute, where did this come from? So the the first point I'd like to make in debating this was that Kevin said it came from a members of the audit committee. Who, who said, in their opinion, this process should follow that of the budget process. So that's where that came from. Hold on. And you're right, that was inconsistent with the guidance he originally gave us, where he said that this was going to be primarily a town council decision. Now, so what I'm going to, I'm going to debate it by saying, if we want to, if we want to be relevant, if we want this to be primarily a town council decision, which is what I hear you saying, then we have to do what Mark Jimsky just challenged us to do, which is define the parameters. Exactly. Because if we don't do anything, Kevin's going to make a list. He's going to define the process. He's going to define the parameters. And we're going to do what we typically do, what we're good at, which is come in at the end and approve something. So yeah, we have to come up with those parameters and soon because kevin isn't going to wait around for no, us to but i but i would organized. like to have the audit committee come and sure. and basically speak to us about what they see our role as being or what the parameters i'm going to say be. you know what it doesn't matter what the audit committee thinks you don't have okay. to worry about that they made an opinion you can go argue with them you know privately if you want but it's more important than going off and arguing with the audit committee or Kevin that we come up with the parameters. Got it. The Agreed. Audit, the audit we want the ball, child. take the ball. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Agreed. Right now, we haven't really exhibited the leadership. Right. 
And, and John, I think we're in the process of doing just that. I mean, we and just had a meeting last week. I mean, we can only work right. so fast. Right. And, and all of our input to Mark in establishing the parameters, we are going to establish parameters. And I, I actually think that the meeting with, you know, any of the organizations is wildly premature. Yeah. Okay. I would, I would, uh, no, I, I think it's, that, John? It, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. That. I, I think this is one of the best meetings I've been in in four years in the town council where we had people come to us and actually tell us what they thought, yes. where we could ask some questions as opposed to just listen and not respond. I, I think this was extremely, extremely good. And, and I'm, I'm of John's opinion, which says it's interesting that the audit committee said that we should drive this like the budget, uh, but I just ignore that. I mean, and if we put parameters in place, then when it comes to us, if the parameters aren't met, we turn it down. It's just that easy. We don't have to approve the appropriations. We, we generally get put in a position where we haven't laid the parameters out. It comes to us and we say, we're going to turn it down. They say, why'd you turn it down? You've been through all this stuff. You, you, why'd you turn it down? You didn't stop us before. Well, if we want to stop them, we ought to stop them now. We ought to tell them what to do now. We ought to, we ought to answer Bill's question and say, what do you want? And, and I think those are, I think we should get a meeting, you know, tomorrow or next, you know, yeah. uh, before the end of the week that says, yeah. let's really lay them down. I mean, what spoke to me here was a lot of these things were very easy to parse through. Childcare is something that's been driven by COVID yes. because we've changed our work environment. And the, the, for, the, for these funds to be spent to help that, to me, is right down the line of what it ought to be. Great. To paint Vine Cottage is our responsibility as a town to do. I don't know why we'd look to the federal government to pay for that. Uh, and, I, and in going through this, if you relate what it is, I mean, if you take a look at the powerhouse, the powerhouse is clearly a development project that will drive economic value to the town. And that's what the federal government wanted us to spend this on. Agreed. Right? And so it, it is exactly, now I don't know how much and et cetera, but to me, when you set a parameter out, it ought to be driving development. It ought to be related to how the town is going to react to COVID. What kind of things do we need different than we had in town before? What kind of transportation needs do we need different? Nobody's addressed that at all. What kind of communication needs do we have? Nobody's addressed that at all either, right? I mean, one thing was mentioned and, and who mentioned it? Somebody mentioned it earlier. It was Chris mentioned we could have hotspots in the parks. Yeah, that'd be pretty interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, while you're while you're on your Zoom call, you could be sitting out on the Waveney porch uh, uh, and watching that. I mean, there's a lot of things that have just not been been driven here, and I think the parameters ought to, ought to define that. Correct. I think there has to be a more clear vision in so many different directions, um, and we need to start sooner rather than later. So, Mark. <laughs> well. I'm I think it's real simple for me. My top priority is going to be childcare. That's going to be the number one item. Okay. Then I can debate with myself, you know, where the next ones down are, you know, are they, are they public space infrastructure programs? A la Chris Shipper, you know, and our, and our friends with the powerhouse and uh, town players. Yes, probably. Um, do I think that I want to, uh, you know, provide continuing funding, you know, for the Board of Realtors, you know, for their website? Probably not. But I think that's something. But, I mean, but, if you're but, asking, if you know, you're going to make yes or yeah. no decisions tonight, that's exactly, you know, and set it, priorities it, it, as I go. If, 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 Sven, if you were to look at the parameters that we've loosely discussed, everything you just said would fall right into those parameters. And it would be a yes or no answer. Right. And that, that would be the beauty of it, as Rich pointed out. But there's so some things that we've identified that should be part of the budget. And I think that to identify what those are is just as important to us in our process as it is to those right. organizations. Agreed. Well, one, 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 one of the parameters, one of those parameters. When you make the vote this year, you know, right. in April. Right. One of those. But I hope that you do put money aside every year, you know, for land acquisition. You see, the discussion has been over the past years when we when we get to that line item is do is there value in having money set aside in the amounts that we have been proposing? 
you know, 50,000, 100,000, so forth? Or is the town with our resources and our general fund and so forth, have the wherewithal to when an opportunity, you know, comes mm -hmm. that we could right then and there fund whatever the, you know, required amount is and not have set asides? because we have that flexibility in our, in our budget. And well, so are we, cons you know. It becomes a question of, you know, like how long is the process to do that? Yeah. Then? Oh, but you, well, like, you, we, we can I, have meetings. I, we can, I, think, I, think I know, Penny, we can I have what, meetings for months. What Penny's saying, I think is, is really important because mm -hmm. we got $30 million sitting in the That's general right. fund and we're talking about putting $50,000 aside a year to buy land when it's going to be a couple million bucks. No, agree. We could do it without even thinking about it. Yes, but the problem is that when it comes time to take a vote, nobody wants to push that button. And I think that if we earmark a million dollars or half a million to be set aside for open space, should the right property come about, then I think it's more doable. I, I think you earmark that in the general fund. And yes. the general fund's supposed to have 10% or 15% extra. So it's 15% plus 2 million for open space. It's always there. Fine. Done. But but we have to agree that we will do that. So everybody's in agreement at that at that level and at that point. That's that's the board of finance that has to agree, right? Because they're have the ones to that it. It. No, no, you don't have to approve the mill rate. You don't have to approve. You don't no, have to no. prove how much they hold in the general fund. You get to prove what we spent. No, okay. So we have to put in a proposal for the board of finance to earmark x right. amount of funds and spend down the general fund. Period. Yes, but that's you and me. Yeah. <laughs> but even even so, we could spend it down by a 10 million bucks and still have the 2 million bucks left for, for open space if it showed up. Yes. Right. Yeah, but what Chris was saying, I think a little bit was that like the property next to Mead Park, which came up. Do you really think the process could be done so quickly if, if a property next to a park came up? Mm -hmm. Do you think developers are going to say, oh, I'm going to wait for this to go through the whole process or do you have the money there and then to be able to acquire it? The money is there. I'll no, no, I'm saying- I'll, I'll, I'll answer that there, there but we can't get it out of there. Space. I'll answer that with specifics because I think it's useful to hang specifics and put specific dollar amounts. Um, when Irwin Park became available, we had a sympathetic seller who gave this town enough time. And I'm gonna say at least a year to go through the process that government goes through and bond it with a referendum. I mean, it was a long, you know, a more than one year process. Um, the, in contrast to that, when the Fowler property came up, it was a good thing that we had a land trust that was nimble and we had a, and that was a $1.2 million process. And even then it took the town probably six months to come up with the $250,000 of matching money. And so, and, and once again, you had somebody in Mr. Fowler mm -hmm. who, was, who was sympathetic to this and wanted this to happen and gave us enough time. And we had a partner who was uh, organized. And at I'm the not, end, we bent the rules a little bit anyway. And now con contrast that to the um, 20 acres on Weed Street at Indian Waters Road, mm -hmm. where we were not able to move and even though you had an uprising of all the neighbors and were upset over that, and yeah. you know it was a big deal to that community, we did not have a mechanism in place. And more importantly, it was not even a decision that left the first selectman's office. Right. So if you don't like the fact that the decision oftentimes is somebody says to the first selectman, do you want the land? And, the, and, the fir and a future first selectman will just say yes or no. And more often we'll say no, because he knows it's going to be a, a year long, you know, um, process. Yep. It's easy for first selectmen to say no if they don't have any money and no earmark in the budget. But those are three examples and, and different size examples. But we've improved our response time when we bought the property adjacent to the library and provided the funds fairly soon. So we can move fast if we want to. The biggest drawback is having the decision, the initial decision whether to move or not based on one office, which is the first selectman. And that can make or kill a deal. Well, I'll just say on, on this, the town council already made the decision three years ago that we want a land acquisition fund. We want this to be not an ARPA 
one-time event. We want this thing to be done a little bit at a time so that it does not become a burden for one year of taxpayer, but that it becomes a small burden over every year, over a very long period of time. I would, if I pulled the town council today, I would, I would bet that the town council would still feel that way, that this isn't a one-time thing. This is a responsive, if we have the responsibility at all, that it is a responsibility, if we have the responsibility, and I know not everybody thinks that we should be in this business of acquiring open space, but if we do, we should smooth it out over a long period of time. I, I think, but I'll poll you if you want to be polled on, on the subject. And then the second question would be, how much? And if we can agree on an amount, then we should tell the Board of Finance, this is we think we have the responsibility, we want it smoothed out, and this is how much we think you ought to look for. And then, and then we put it back in their lap. That's how you handle that. I would like to revisit something my, my friend Sven said, which was the child care. And he said it was a priority. I agree. I really do think that uh, that resonated with me, the YMCA presentation and Bill Flynn, when yes. he started talking about roofs, I'm like, yeah, roofs, you know, broken roof. I love. But he said, we have a waiting list for childcare too. Right. And I thought, you know what? It's not just the YMCA. We probably have several opportunities for childcare. And uh, like Sven, I think it's an important. But when, but Sven said infrastructure, number two, hmm, some of this infrastructure, I do think should be on the five-year capital plan. And right. some of these, um, operational programs such as uh, Live New Canaan, 60 grand, uh, which is over several years, and the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society over several years, um, I wouldn't necessarily disqualify that. And, and, and you did, and I'd like to put it back in as a parameter. I, I had to name top three. Fair enough. Okay. John, can I add to that? Because so I was I was impressed with your argument at the beginning that said this is an opportunity where we can we can we can build a prototype now that will never get through the budget, but may be very important to the town. Something that would be unique, and, and this is an appropriate time to do it. I agree with that 100. percent I agree with Sven as well. The child care ought to be number one. I, I don't understand why uh, the market doesn't solve the child care problem in Canaan, but it's not going to. It needs to be solved. And I think that the suggestion that perhaps some, that some of the vacant town buildings could be used for child care is not a bad idea. Thank you. Uh, yes, but as I understand, the Board of Ed is also working on something and they cited West School as probably being the best location for it at this time. I think if, if we just open our minds to not just one organization, right. but whoever is willing and able to do it, that the town can back, I think we should definitely consider it. I, I agree with you. Just from my parameter standpoint, I, I agree with Sen's parameters. Child care, I think, is important. I, I think it's really important to be able to lean into the wind and maybe we do something for the museum because, the, you know, this design thing is a pretty impressive thing. And th the other thing besides COVID is development of the town, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's supposed to be what this is focused on. And I think that kind of thing would fit in this very well, as well as open space. But I would solve open space. The, the problem, I don't think putting $50,000 into a fund over 10 years makes any difference at all. I think you need to come up with a process for buying land that is different. Right. And maybe it is every year you put, you, you put a capital expenditure in the plan of 2 million bucks for open space and you approve it, uh, you approve it going through and maybe you never spend it. And then two years from now, you do it again. And then I don't two years think, from now, you do it again. I actually think that, and you maybe you can help me with the research on this, but I actually think it's illegal for us to, in our budget, establish a sinking fund. Right. You can't actually do it legally. That's yeah. that's but, why but you might that, have a unique opportunity here with the ARPA funds to actually put money in an account because it's not like the budget, which is restricted in that regard. Well then, how can you put it? How can you put it in a fund? How can you put it in a fund? Fifty thousand dollars. That's right. Is, that's a sinking fund. You, the open space is a sinking fund. You're putting fifty thousand bucks a year into a fund to to spend land on land. But we've done it before with the enterprise fund for the pool, and I think we've done it with other. Well, we don't have to solve. We don't have to solve that here. Right. right. I'm just. I'm just saying. It, I think it's. A, I, it needs research and it needs a different process than what we have today. 
Yes. Because I don't think 50,000 bucks a year carries it. Those funds are used, Christina. Yeah. The enterprise fund is very different than just putting it in a fund to at some point in time. So you're taxing people on monies that you're just putting in a fund for at some point in time in the future going to use, as opposed to the enterprise fund, which are fees, users' fees, and the swimming pool. Um, that go into the fund reserves. that are used for maintenance of the pool and and rebuilding, you know, when those kinds of capital projects come come due. And Aaron Lieblin's book thought lets us all know here that there's a specific, specific state statute that allows for the creation of land acquisition funds. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Who said that? Aaron? Aaron. All right. And you tax okay. people for that? Mm hmm specifically for that one i guess sinking funds for a, a town pool maybe not but you know or some unknown future project but specifically I, I do think they did pass the rule the, the law at the state and not that long ago that allowed this to be an exception so yeah because it's a priority at the state level so they, right. they carved it out yeah they're trying to get um connecticut 2023 Municipalities are supposed to make up 11% of the open space and Connecticut deep parks make up 10%. Okay, that 11%, you really have got to understand what the components of that 11%. No, are. but that's why it was passed that they can do that. That okay, they passed it, it is recently. not just the municipalities. It Agreed. is municipalities and, and water property and foundations. No, it's protected open space. Yes, it came from John Rowland's administration. He had a blue ribbon uh, task force that developed this, and it's 10% of the state lands are to be owned by the state, and 11% are to be owned by municipalities, foundations, and water companies. So yes. it's not just every town has to have 11%. It's 11% of the whole state. But I think that's part of the problem is the water companies aren't holding these lands anymore, as we saw mm -hmm. off of Wheat Street. Which that's puts a different, more that's a different on us. discussion. It is okay. not 11% of yeah. the Canaan. Let's get back to our uh, okay. Mark's well, parameters. It's a, it's a difference. <laughs> it's, it's a there's significant difference. Well, okay. I'd like to talk about projects <laughs> other than land acquisition. Mark, can we set up a, a meeting? Absolutely. Uh, Perhaps and, by the end of the week. But, Aaron mm -hmm. is saying 21% total, 10% is for towns. 11% is from Rantrust Water Companies, etc. 10% is by the state. I'm no. Just reading you what he put in the chat. I know. I've studied it for years. <laughs> no, Penny, I think you're mistaken. Sorry, he said 10% state. 10% of the land of the state of Connecticut is to be owned by the state. 11% divided by municipalities and foundations and water company. And it is not 11% of each municipality. It's 11% of the state lands. I'd like to talk about some stuff other than just the land acquisition. Okay, Sven, go ahead. Well, I'm uh, soliciting the opinions of some people who've been uh, fairly quiet so far. So I've looked at this as an opportunity to listen and listen to different presentations. And we've heard them from a wide variety of folks. And from the beginning, this $6 million, I, I, I appreciate the fact that the selectmen are putting together their list. Then they're going to bring it to the Board of Finance and we're going to listen to the selectmen. We're going to listen to the Board of Finance. Ultimately, the folks that I want to listen to the most, and I said this at our last meeting, was our subcommittee who will take all that information and report it back to the council. <laughs> and ultimately, right from the beginning, it's the $6 million is the responsibility of the town council. Everybody can weigh in on this, but only one body can decide where the money goes. And we have to have this kind of meeting where we're listening to all this, but and, and ultimately, that subcommittee is playing a very important role to me because Mark, when, when you come back to us and you say, Hey, we've, we've spoken to the board of selectmen. We, we've taken all that information. We, we've listened to the board of finance. We've taken all that information. The community foundations weighed in. 
all of those folks have weighed in. This is what we think as the subcommittee. This is the town council subcommittee charged with that duty. And when you come back to us, that will play a very, very important role. So that's where, where I am tonight. So. And it's actually a committee of the town council and the board of finance. Yes. Right. In right. establishing the parameters. Yeah, it was very helpful. I'll just yeah. give an example that I, this was meaningful because originally I, I, my, and I voice my opinion to, to a few that we should not be funding the general fund. Then Christina made a great point and Amy as well in, in the subcommittee meeting or in the committee meeting, whatever we want to call it. But maybe if, if the, it was designated for a specific project, then it falls within and it meets the criteria, supports all the town, uh, everyone in town, et cetera, then we can. And then I changed my opinion. That's because the parameters work if we set them up and we agree on them. So uh, yeah, just echo Steve's point. We, we need to we need to discuss what what's important mm -hmm. to the to the body and and look at it from what do you think? What's here? your little Myers Briggs doodle here? <laughs> I, I'm I am uh, you're, yeah. I'm wrestling with what Mark said, which is the parameters. And I don't think that we've not set parameters, but I'm just struggling with the fact that the uh, the parameters are changing. And you know, I had at one time thought that there would be a nonprofit quarter. There would be an investment in New Canaan um, ec uh, economy uh, quarter, and I thought TDAC would probably be, you know, a, a big voice in that. But I haven't heard TDAC or the Chamber of Commerce, and so on the lists that we've seen, I would say, you know, th that quarter has gotten smaller. I've seen government, which is the third quarter gotten larger. I've seen more projects, maybe not necessarily the dollar amount, may, maybe that also, but just in terms of flexi pave and the painting of the vine cottage, you know, government needs uh, got bigger. <laughs> TDAC needs. But and, those and are easy. Economy. Those don't fall under, if we set That's the parameters, smaller. they do not fall. With no, I know, but, but this that is the way I, so when I hear these proposals, I think, oh, which quarter? And green Chris Shipper, I have to give him credit, said, I really think green isn't part of New Canaan Community Foundation and just another nonprofit. You know, green, sustainability, all that important to this community. It, 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 it deserves a quarter of the, conver of the conversation. Um, not necessarily open space acquisition, but, you know, even maybe the flexi pay. Maybe that's not a government project. Maybe that's a green project. Anyway, so when I look at these projects, I think of them you know, with that lens, these four quadrants. And that's what, that's Sven, what got me excited about Live New Canaan and New Canaan Museum and Historical Society, not trying to fix a broken carriage or a roof, but actually looking forward looking, right? Live New Canaan and New Canaan Museum both had forward looking ideas about how to draw more people from the outside and engage in our community in ways that would probably, you know, bring tourism bring more people to eat, shop, you know, and consider moving to our town. Those were the only two proposals in that quadrant that, um, you know, that I've heard. We had before in July, the Chamber of Commerce spoke up, as did TDAC, um, and, it was, and there were a few others that actually spoke to it as well, that one of the number one things that they felt that we could do for the downtown, because there's not one right. mandate that we can do to help the, each individual business, was to support the restoration and opening of the playhouse. They felt that that was going to drive a lot of traffic. So that playhouse is supposed to be filling that quarter. That was a more spoke to that. Got it. As well as the chamber does have a request in here, and you'll see it on your sheet on the other projects, but the number one project for the downtown seemed to be, everybody seemed to be in agreement that it would be the uh, playhouse restoration project. Because when I look at the, the, the short list that came from the selectmen, um, it's only the playhouse. Yeah, it's only the playhouse. Okay, so now I understand why. That was TX and uh, the chambers. So I'm looking at that lens. Uh, um, Furnace fire, 107 Pocono Trail. Thank, thank God we have you here. How do you feel about providing operational money, not capital, not necessarily capital? Capital is always easy, right? We know what a roof costs. We know what a playhouse costs. Yep. Cap 
And I think there is an inherent bias against operational because we don't know what Live New Canaan should cost or what should design uh, October for design. We don't know what it should cost because it's not like a roof. So this we, you know, the, the community foundation arm to me is, is the one that's going to handle those operational needs to me that would go under that umbrella. Mm. And uh, I don't, I, I think when you come out of this, you do need to, to be true to the ARPA funds. You need to address those operational issues. And I think the community foundation will, but you also with this kind of money, you want to make an, you may want to make a lasting impact on this community somehow. You don't want to look back and say, boy, we had $6 million. Where did it go? Where did it go? Like, there's nothing we can see that mm -hmm. we did. So, That's why you want shovel ready projects. Well, you know, it's, it's a lot of money. They're sexier. Well, not, they're long lasting. I mean, that's, this is an impactful moment where I'm you can- I'm just going to challenge you and say, well, what about dredging a pond? It's harder to see, but I mean, is that less important? No, but that falls that's under- maintenance. That, that to me, that's in the green bucket. Yeah. That, that to me okay, goes in the green but bucket. Is that less sexy than building something like the Playhouse? 750, you know, for a Playhouse, but we can, which we can all see is easy to fund versus- or, or or Patricia's project, right? right. That is a sexy project, yeah. right? It's got a model right here versus <laughs> dredging a pond. That's just never sexy. But very also, sexy, Patricia. Very sexy. But there's also need, and you need yeah. child care more than you need to dredge a pond. So they're the things that surface really? to the top. Because the I by the way, if you don't dredge the pond, eventually the pond goes away, and then you can't. Then it's a swamp, and you know it becomes a, yeah. To me, it becomes a what? But that's a five-year capital project that may get put in front of everything else mm -hmm. because of the urgency. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that's going to impact as much as providing and fulfilling a need. And a need is childcare, for example. And child, I mean, child care is not a bronze plaque project. Right. The other thing is that you have two projects, both the October for Design and the Live New Canaan, that they're not ideas. They've already been put forward. They, they've been basically um, seeded by monies from those organizations. And they have a proven track record that can only deliver more if we contribute to it. But what impact does that really have on the community, which is, I'm picking up on Amy's um, comment. She said, I'd like to, when we're thinking about these projects, and in three years, sit back and look at it, have we really, really made a difference in our community? Haven't yeah. we? No, and, and she said, that's, that's how you should be judging yes. these projects. Yes, right. and it's not have they made an impact, but will they continue to make an impact moving forward? Yeah. And how right. much of an impact? And I think that we need to take the responsibility as the town to make sure that our, our community grows and that the businesses are successful. And there's very few opportunities to do it in a way in which there's already a track that's proven to work. If that was the parameter, then you would not give 15,000 to the veterans because you would say it wasn't a, a sexy capital project i can't measure the impact it's no just 11 uh old men what do you say drooling they're 11 old men putting wreaths in a so it would be difficult and um and oh by the way some of these organizations are very well organized to ask money from our budget every year and some of these like those veterans are less sophisticated, smaller organizations that have never asked for money before and probably never will again. And, and those are the small, the small ass that are easy to say, it's not gonna impact. We have $6 million, 11,000 may not be worth arguing about. It's not just small. Actually, the powerhouse theater is, is, has got a big ask. The biggest ask on the page mm -hmm. is coming from an organization that does not typically come before us and ask for money and has no sophistication in the budget process. Sorry, but it does not have grant writers. <laughs> 
books. They don't have like grant writers, like, you know, like some of these others do. But the I, library is very sophisticated. Yes. The powerhouse theater is not sophisticated. They're getting there though. They're getting there. Yes, but I have two, two issues with the community foundation. One, that they can disperse funds outside of the UK and we want to impact the UK. No, that's exactly what this means. The meeting is not to sit there and discuss the specific requirements. The meeting is more are we going to dictate only in the opinion? Is there the process going to mirror their process that they have now, which we've heard is a very thorough process? It could be overwhelming to some of the nonprofits. What information do you all need from them to start the allocation process, decision process? But why is that meeting taking place without the committee? They requested to sit with us to make sure that, that we are on board with what their process currently is, and if that process is something that would be appropriate in, in this decision. I would like to, you to ask, I would like you to get uh, one of my liaisons, Mark, and, and you know the four that we've identified, invite one of them at least to the meeting. It would be important to us that we hear how that went. And we know, therefore, what responsibilities we have to get answers back to the Community Foundation. Safe to say, the Community Foundation knows nonprofits in town probably better than any of us, right? So that was why it just made sense to, to allow them to be part of this uh, process. Yeah. Uh, Mark, you have a question. I could make um, an argument, though, that the meeting that is scheduled with the Community Foundation is premature until we establish our parameters yeah. because if we have organizations sitting here tonight saying we really don't know what we're here to propose for you uh, to you um that i think that that it's they should have it, a it's meeting. just a little ahead of the game yeah i don't want to tell them not to have a meeting i just want to tell them if they're going to have a meeting to invite one of the four one of the four of you liaisons to it and that way you'll know if you have to answer some questions around parameters. All right, so okay. by the way, this list that we are looking at is a really good start. Yeah, so, you know, it got, it, it started with just one side of the page and then now it's get it's getting- Well, you're gonna have, you're gonna have the-, the Better all the time. You're going to have more specifics as you go forward, but this, to start, this is a great start, so. Um, at least it gives us a little bit of a roadmap. Mm -hmm. I think the, the key question is what's missing that we think should be there. Right, and that's why we're having the, a public exactly. meeting like this. So. Exactly. Well, two more things came up tonight that they now be added to this. There's the Nature Center and the very smart request. There's probably a bunch more who listen to this meeting who, are, yeah. who, who want to be Which on the Which is why list. we got to get those parameters out there. Then people understand whether or not what their proposal, you know, would be is actually something that would so, do you, so we should probably um, adjourn this meeting, and but yes. not before we hear from you, Mark and Penny, and my my committee chairs who are responsible for this. When do you want to have our next meeting, or what is our next step? How do we want to discuss setting the parameters? I mean, I mean, I have a list we've discussed. It needs to be. Um, Mark, discuss more why don't reviewed, we set up but we meeting. can't we can't have a you know, we need to have a another meeting and more input yeah um, he has to publicly we're... notice that right yes. and yes. how much time does he have to do, give it 24. okay especially yeah. but the board of finance members have to be on there as well mm -hmm. you guys can have a meeting without them but you can i mean you can invite them whatever you want yeah, well, we're, so we're in contact with them. Now. We're in contact with them. We can't now then just go have a meeting without them. <laughs> no, so I have the what, initial meeting. You should always the invite them, but if one of the six of you can't make it, you know, have your meeting anyway. Yeah. Try to include as many. Try to include. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Nobody's the same not to. But so you want to have a public hearing again, Mark? No. 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 no that's what I'm trying to. <laughs> Sorry, that's why I'm no, I would I would picture it as a working meeting. Right. Work, you're, yes. you're setting the parameters that correct that you know here's that's what I was trying to ask. How do we do it where it's just the group of it's just us? So you call you call a meeting, it's a public meeting. Anyone can yeah. attend. Yes. You, yes, you can take public comment, but then you need to get into your group at work. Night, right? Mm -hmm. So 
That's next like Tuesday. in the little glass mm -hmm. room. Yeah. Correct. Next right. Tuesday. Night. Yeah. Yes. It's a night meeting. Yes. Right. Tuesdays are hot. Tuesdays. That would be the soonest. Rolling. Tuesday night. Tuesday night could works works for me. Okay. okay. So we're going to try, so the public knows, we're going to try and move this along by next Tuesday with another or working group meeting, and you'll all be able to attend it or watch it, um, but it will not be a public hearing. Board, board of Finance, I just thought oh, that. Okay. Okay, oh, so, so that's then a the problem. Board of Finance people couldn't attend. Right. Maybe Monday then. Yeah. It's uh, Columbus Day. Oh, Wednesday. Do we meet on Wednesday? Can we meet anyway someplace else? Can we meet? Can anyone meet during the day? Yeah, no, I can. Because I can meet. I mean, the day. And it be, can be a, a Zoom meeting. No, I understand that. I'm just trying to just um, spitballing times. And, just put out some times. Yeah, and they get together. Yeah, put they, out some know, times. At night, it, 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 yeah. Some days are going right. to get more challenging. But I think the question is: Is there more input we want before we actually set the parameters? So I think the I think the the output of this meeting ought to be a list of parameters. This is what we right. No, and, and in listening to everyone, it, it, I mean, you you can see it start to take yeah, shape. I think. So I, I, think I, mean, I, I don't I, think we need I've a whole listen lot more. to everyone. Yeah. I think we're kind of on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we agree on some things like daycare. We disagree on other things. But, but like it's not that I want to go out and say I agree with daycare. But when you think about what ARPA represents, the the COVID impact, right. how it's impacting our community, it's non recurring. Right. It meets all of the things we've already discussed without right. having to say to the public, I'm in support of of giving half a million dollars to, to the YMCA for for, for child care. But giving more specific specificity. On the sure. relative weights, the weighting of those importances. Well, that's I where think, everyone has to give input. I, I, I yeah. that's you and know, we will one, one, yeah, one or two people. Right no, and of course, we but know. but those parameters are going to last for for if it takes three years, right. three years. We're not going to get it. Had it can't be recurring. That, that's obviously one that we all agree on. That's it's, an example. It's the Jimsky white paper about how we're going to do this. <laughs> Should we all write to you? I, I mean, I'm happy. Yeah, and you can collect be, it and see if you could assimilate yes, things that, that, that are, that are common among maybe yeah, all of us. Hey, I, I welcome that. Okay. And that's what I've been hoping for. Okay. Yeah. So you can email me a lot on this. Okay. <laughs> and you can all email them too. I, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the library, that, it, that now we can move on. Yeah, right. we're, we're moving on. <laughs> I'm, I'm moving on. All right. We're in a good place. <laughs> good. Okay. Anything further? Oh. Any? No. So I'm you're gonna, to we have a move to I'm adjourn. Sorry, I mean, I mean, we have a second. Doodle the letters. It's a time for a meeting. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Just send me. Yeah. Yeah. Rich, yeah. Rich. Yeah. Uh, raise your hand if we're going to adjourn. Okay, I think we're adjourned. we're adjourned. Thank you. Nine forty-two, everybody.